All right, who's ready for Brand Iceberg? No, not every stream is going to be an iceberg. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's just a chapter reread, but it is one. It is the Brand chapter, very much so. So, Grey Waste Tim, you horned in on my stream, buddy. I was going to do this by myself, and you were like... <laughs> So what you doing this Sunday? I was like, oh, nothing, just a reread chapter. Oh, what chapter? Oh, you know, brand three. Oh, wait, is that the Weirwood Vision one? Yeah, so you're here to shoehorn the Blackfires into this discussion, aren't you, Tim? Oh, yeah, yeah, because there's, there's always that line, we'll get to it in there. But no, I'm here. I got things to say about Bran and his visions and the children of the forest and all that. I'm like not you a one-trick pony. <laughs> Don't typecast me as a Blackfire simp, he says. <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting better with the symbolism. Everyone said so last week. <laughs> no, you are. You absolutely are. Of course, of course we kid. Of course we kid. And I'm always happy to have you. Um, I try to save you for the stuff where you're, you know, especially the stuff where I'm weak on. But uh, always welcome, always welcome. And of course, the uh, this is the the chapter where Bran has a series of weird visions. Um, and uh, I've got my Led Zeppelin shirt. Is still some debate about whether this is supposed to be Icarus or Lucifer. If it's Icarus, I feel like the wings should be melting because he has wax wings. So to me, it looks mm -hmm. more like Lucifer. But maybe somebody knows what Zeppelin intended and they can clarify in the chat. Either one works for me. Bran is very Icarus-like with his climbing and falling and grabbing for the fire of the gods. And, uh, you know, um, so we, we yep. think of also Prometheus, which is a big one for A Song of Ice and Fire. And um, according to Melisandre, Bran and Bloodraven are actually more like Lucifer, the villains. Isn't that right, Tim? Yeah, that's why, since I usually always try to be on theme up for my shirts, I'm wearing the big villain, evil mentor program. Because uh, this is like, when we think of Bran and Bloodraven, like, th this isn't just some nice old wizard teaching a kid some magic. This is very much like, this is almost like Palpatine. Uh, training Anakin like that that is the feel I'm pretty sure that's what George drew upon when he put these two together very cool so first of all thank you for the super chat Kate Lisi and yes Tim there's a lot of evil mentors uh in the story or at least questionable mentors everyone thinks Quaithe is evil I think Quaithe is on the up and up you know um Melisandre is going to be mentoring John kind of like yeah, Blood Raven, Melisandre, Quave, Marwin the Mage. These are our mentors. Of course, we did have Ned Stark for a hot second, but, uh, you know, off with his head. So, that being said, Bran is Sauron. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, not really, but <laughs> he, the, the interesting thing with Bran, of course, is that he is kind of like a child and he is getting his hands on the fire of the gods. And so, that's interesting because he's not old enough to have the, the moral complexity that we adults have, but he's also, he's on the cusp of that teenage, you know, all, nearly a man grown kind of age. So he's got some awareness, like he understands the Hodor doesn't like it when he skin changes Hodor, but we'll get to that. So I guess we can, mm. yeah, I'm just trying to think of anything else I want to say before the chapter starts. This is the one where, it's a bit of like a series of vignettes, uh, montages, if you will. We're going to need a montage. Give the music. And um, uh, it's the, the moon is, is what's interspersing the different scenes. So it's a very poetic chapter. It's a very s surreal chapter. I think George, you know, he, Bran is tripping in this chapter. He's eating the wayward paste. He's seeing visions. And to sort of contribute to the feel of that. I feel mm -hmm. I think that is why George chose to write this chapter in these sort of vignettes. It's like all the days are running together. They're just different scenes disconnected in time. That's what the experience is like being underground with no time, eating drugs, um, weird paste, obviously not not real drugs, fant fictional fictional drugs. Easy the YouTube monitors. Um, <laughs> no one can eat weird paste. It's not real. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so this is going to be a, um, a fun read, and like I said, a little bit of a surreal thing. There will be some symbolism. We're definitely going to center the visions, though. We're going to try to 
not just talk about Azor High and the Weirwood Net and all that crap that I usually say, um, <laughs> according to some people. I mean, I usually do talk about that stuff, but we're going to try to figure out what these visions mean, both in terms of archetypal symbolism and the plot. You know, what what is Bran actually seeing? I notice also, um, Tim, that this chapter comes kind of early in A Dance with Dragons. So Bran only has three chapters, which George says is because... Uh, he knows too much now. He, you know, can only have like Melisandre only gets one chapter because these characters will give away too much if we're in their heads for too long. Um, but mm-hmm. this chapter comes kind of early. It's only like chapter thirty something out of fifty some. So it could be that there is something in this chapter that George wanted us to know before the climax of the story. I'm not w- sure what that would be, but I just want to put a pin in that and see if we can figure out what that might be. Because you could have put this yeah. later in the in the book. You know, oh, it, um, it is. It's it's chapter thirty four, um, and if we include the epilogue and the appendix, there's seventy three chapters. So this is like right at the halfway point, and yet it's the very it's the last brand chapter we've had for twelve years. So right, I'm just not sure what it could be, but there there could be a reason that he snuck it in this early. So we got to think about the climax of the story. Mostly, I would think something to do with John and. All that stuff, but those visions cover a lot of ground. So let's get into it and see what happens. And then also, real quick, I've got a PayPal or two that's come in. So thank you very much to Ludmila. And see if Ludmila asked. Yes, she did. We see children of the forest sacrifice to the weirwoods and to the others. I love it when weirwoods gets autocorrected weirdos. That's always fun. Mm -hmm. Got to sacrifice to the weirdos. I mean, that is true. Um, let's see, possibly, okay, so we're, we see children, not children of the forest, but like babies, sacrificed to the weirwoods and to the others, possibly one and the same thing. Also, we tend to call the children of the forest just children. I wonder, could it be that the others originally wanted men to sacrifice children of the forest for some reason, and over time, men started sacrificing their own children? Well, it, I would be more apt to say that, um, George is doing kind of a reader clue thing here. Like often characters um, are children when they are symbolic children of the forest. Like Patchface, for example, when he comes to uh, Dragonstone, he is a child that can do magic and sing. And he's tattooed green and red. So we're supposed to be like, oh, a child who sings and does magic. That's symbolic of a child of the forest. Then he drowns and becomes a weird, like, green man, undead green man character. So there's obviously a string without getting lost under the sea. There's a narrative about green seer stuff that's going on with Patchface. And him being a child, in that case, represents Child of the Forest. So I also think that's why George calls Leanna a child woman. is because Leanna, as the Knight of the, Weirwood, Knight of the Laughing Tree, is doing a lot of weirwood symbolism and represents some sort of Nissa Nissa or Night's Queen figure, and all those figures are coded as children of the forest or elf women or hybrids or something like that. Here we go. See, I'm already in the weirwood net, Tim. Uh, but I'm answering the question. Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm doing good. So yes, it could be that... What do you think about originally... So we... The Hammer of the Waters legend. Well, of course, I just just put out a Mo Kalen video... And we've been talking about the Hammer of the Waters. I'm working on one about the Pact right now. And, uh, you know, it says that uh, one version of the Hammer legend says that children of the forest were sacrificed on the Isle of Faces to call down the Hammer. Now, I tend to, it never takes long to get to the weird net. Yeah, no, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't. It's everywhere. That's the thing. It's ever present. It's everywhere at once. It's everywhere and nowhere. Um, the sacrifice of children of the forest to call down the hammer it might be the same story as Azor killing Nissa Nissa to break the moon because that moon meteor is the what is the real hammer and Nissa Nissa might be a child of the forest. So the, the stories are kind of similar. So yeah, we do have a potential scenario where the original creation of the others involves sacrifice of children of the forest. Um I don't know that men were supposed to continue to sacrifice children. I don't think that would be part of it. But could it 
Do you think, Tim, could there be anything to the others wanting children of the forest? They seem to be able to survive in the north okay. I guess stick into the warded caves or maybe there's maybe the children of the forest run faster. What do you think? Yeah. Well, if we think of the idea that the others were created by the children as sort of a weapon to fight against humans, then it does make sense that they'd want them because there that it becomes a story of the creation turning against the master and then going after the master. That's the that's the Mary Shelley's Frankenstein sense of that. And it makes sense to me that uh, the others are something that, if created by the children, then became something that fell out of their control. Uh, again, going back to the Lovecraftian elements of these stories, anytime we try and walk into the realm of gods, uh, it always brings us down to folly. And what's the <laughs> thing? What is wrong? I am giving you attention, and I'm trying to... I can't give Damon's you Damon's on the mic. He's getting on the mic tonight. <laughs> He's being very vocal. Okay, there he goes. Um, sorry. So you're good. Um, yeah, but so what I'm getting at is, is that it shows that with the children, even they are not immune to that idea because they are here. If they created the others, then creating life becomes another way of treading into the realm of gods, and it becomes something that comes back to bite them when they lose control of that. And it would make sense to me that if the others are a creation of the children, then the others needing children to further their own goals, needing the children's magic, would that would make a lot of sense to me. The kitty was on screen, but the kitty is jet black, as is Tim's shirt, and so it is hard to see. <laughs> There's the cat. Good. See? Yes, there it's all yes. black Here as night. Is... The line of night. Damon is the line of night. Damon. There Get he is. on camera. Show your... Show your golden eyes. There you go. So handsome. <laughs> so yeah, um, of course, my my head cannon is slightly different, but it basically involves Azor Ahai using the magic of the children to create the White Walkers. But there's also Knight's Queen having a role in things, and she might be a child of the forest. And she might be sort of doing a thing where she's turning the tables on Azor Ahai, who invades the Weirwood Net, and then she's sort of stealing his magic and creating a weapon to fight against his people, essentially. So there is a part of the story where the children of the forest, certainly their magic is creating the others. And if Night's Queen is part child, then that's kind of how that story ends up being true. So I, I suspect that if that's the case, the, the thing that the, uh, the children didn't count on was the whites, right? Like we've created mm -hmm. ice demons out of dead green seers that Azor Ahai killed, right? He he invades the Weirwood Net. These green seer spirits are essentially evicted. And it could be that the children gave them ice bodies because it's like it's almost like there was no other way to give them a place to be, right? Um, but let's say mm -hmm. they created them as weapons. And... Oh, shit, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> let's see, what was it? Um... Oh, the whites, right. So you give these evicted green seers. Sorry, guys. I, I just, I won't stop. Almost said something bad. Um, yeah, never mind. Almost made a political reference. Let's not. I did freeze for a second, though. So, so look. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get well soon, everyone. Um, moving right along. Please, please don't run off into politics chat. Please. I'm okay, though. <laughs> Point is, the whites. They, they gave these evicted green seer spirits ice bodies, right? But they were green seers, and so their skin changing magic turned into the ability to raise the dead. And the children maybe didn't anticipate that. And so it's like they always had a way to control the others because they possessed dragon glass. So they create others, but theoretically they could unmake them when they wanted to with just a well placed arrow. It's not even that hard. Okay. The others have to kind of hide and stay elusive. Like, they're fragile. We saw that. Sam popped him with one, one hit, right? So, rest in peace, Sir Puddles. So, that skin changer ability, once they were in this icy sort of half-alive form, they were then able to raise the dead. And that is way more out of control because 
you can there's an infinite supply of the dead to raise you can kill them we saw that on the tv show like the tv show kind of made a mess of it but still you see like any version of fighting a huge army of zombies where when they kill your troops they just turn into more of their troops like this is a problem so mm -hmm. yeah what do you think i i tend to think that's the thing the children didn't count on yeah, again, I think they didn't count on the idea of ever losing control of their own creation. They probably thought, well, this is like this is another nature thing, like ice. Um, they're another form of nature. We're controlling nature, manipulating nature to our whim because we're the children of the forest, and that's our whole, you know, our whole gimmick is we're we're the nature we're the nature sprites, and nature can't hurt you. But it's like, no, nature can hurt you. Nature can be vicious and. Uh, and trying to control of it, trying to control it is again that that folly. It's something that like yeah, you tried to make something uh, using elements in you, in, you know, using using something to your own knowledge that you thought that you had dominion over, and it's just not, it's just not. Something happens, and it's like wait, this wasn't. Then they start raising the dead, and it's like wait, that wasn't part of the plan. I didn't know they could do that. When could they do that? And yeah, it just it, one thing leads to another until so finally it's like, well, you know, the leash is off this dog and I can't catch it. Mute. Mute. Thank you. I was just saying, uh, the one thing that leads me towards think um, seeing this as a story of not the children creating the others straight up, but as... Mm -hmm. The others being created as a consequence of Azor High, who I see mostly as a human, stealing the magic of the children. Because, like, humans are the protagonist of the story. The children are just, they are an adjunct, right? I don't think this story is going to be about, oh, the things the children of the forest did. It's like, at the very least, they did them because of what humans did invading westeros but i really think it's more direct i don't think the children were like oh you pushed us to the edge so we broke the earth and did the hammer or so we made the others like i don't think that's the story i think azor high invading the weirwood net evicts the spirits first then they're given a body perhaps as a last refuge like i said or perhaps because azor high has killed children of the forest like nissa nissa and their dead spirits are working magic in the Weirwood net to create the others or something like that. Because there's a lot of clues that Night's Queen is in the Weirwood net, making the others from the inside. So that kind of tracks with like Nissa Nissa's killed, she's in the Weirwood net, and from there she turns the tables on Azor High, uses the magic. It's because that he invades the Weirwood net that she can use his magic against him, essentially. So the point is. I, I really do feel like there needs to be humans at the center of it causing the trouble with the children's magic essentially having been hijacked. But we'll see how much George even wants to tell us about all that. So I guess we should read the chapter. <laughs> Good question, though, Ludmila. Thank you. It was a generous PayPal, too, so worth the discussion. And also Jonas asks if I'll put the mythical astronomy theme and the reg reading Rhaegar theme on my meager little... Lucifer means Lightbringer Spotify. I suppose I could. I might. Michael Doyle says, uh, the others as allegory for climate change, confirmed or conjecture, because that would heavily imply it's man's fault for their existence. Um, well, it's just what Tim was saying. Um, climate change is really just one version of a bigger idea, which is messing with nature or trying to master nature thinking that we're supreme, thinking that we have power over a lack of humility in the face of nature. That can go a lot of ways. There's many civilizations that have destroyed themselves uh, by not managing their environment properly. Like we're in, even before the Industrial Revolution, there's a lot of evidence that that's what happened to the Maya, for example. So mm -hmm. it's a thing. You have to, um, it's, you know, climate change, it's the obvious one because it's like the others are cold. But climate change isn't just, I mean, it's its all types of climate instability. We're seeing heat waves and floods right now. So, yeah, I mean, it's its a loose parallel, but 
it's a very old theme. Like the theme of mankind's relationship to nature is something that myth makers have been writing about for thousands of years. So I will just say that. Yeah. And any any story, whether sci-fi or fairy tale, any story involving a weather machine never ends well. It's just a running theme throughout that throughout any of those stories. Yeah, I think George has said it, it's not meant to be a direct allegory. And so, like I said, it's basically just working on the broader theme of man's relationship to nature. That's clearly a, a big topic of the story, you know, so. All right. Thanks for the great questions. Tim, did you like my Moat Kalen video, buddy? What do you think? Oh, yeah, I really enjoyed the Moat Kalen video. Uh, very happy that I could contribute. Uh, so, you know, and uh, oh, yeah. And then when you said, I don't know if you saw my comments about the uh, upside down Ireland. And I had said like, oh, yeah, more proof that I'm a squisher because my family's from Cork, Ireland. Oh, your family's from Cork. My brother, my brother traced our genealogy back to Cork from when we came over back to Cork, Ireland. And apparently we still have some distant cousins living out, out there in Cork. <laughs> so. That's pretty funny. Yeah, no, I'm really glad I remembered that little bit about the cork that bottles up the neck. I was like, oh, it's a map joke. That's the best. And yes, everyone loves maps. Lots of comments on the maps. Um, these videos might be doing well, Tim, because all the thumbnails have maps on the side. I, I really think maps are like geography was the best class, wasn't it? I mean, it was so. <laughs> all right, guys, the moon was a crescent. We'll come back to talking a little Mo Kalen stuff later, perhaps if we get into some squisher talk, it, they usually come up. But thanks, everybody, for watching the Mo Kalen video. It is doing really well. And that makes my heart sing. I know you guys liked the squishers that I pasted all over the map and the castle and shit, man. I had fun doing that stuff. You know how you know how I get down. Anyways, the moon. It was a crescent. Thin and sharp as the blade of a knife. Oh, let me make this window smaller. Like right there. Okay. The moon was a crescent, thin and sharp as the blade of a knife. A pale sun rose and set and rose again. Hello, Azor Hyde, dying resurrecting the solar king the sun king azor Hyde. that's him i mean i hate to say it but this is it's mythical astronomy right off the bat the moon is a crescent the blade of a knife we're going to see a crescent knife in this in this chapter and the moon did kill the sun that's the whole thing because the moon explodes and it creates all the dust and blackness that blots out the sun whether that's the moon like the moon smoke, or more importantly, it's the moon meteors falling to earth and then creating the mushroom clouds that cover the earth in smoke. And so that's why this actually gets right back to our story, Tim. The mythical astronomy suggests that Nissa Nissa becomes Night's Queen and takes her revenge on Azor Ahai. And here's why. Azor Ahai is the sun. The red comet is his sword. The moon is Nissa Nissa. So the first thing that happens... The sun stabs the moon with a sword. The moon dies. But when the moon dies, the sun dies too. Because like I said, the moon ends up blotting out the sky with its body, with its moon debris. It's the shower of bleeding stars and the smoke and the ash. So now the sun is dead too. And everything is dark. And then it's like eventually the sun comes back. It's reborn. So that's the, the pale sun setting and then rising again. But it is, it, there is a thing where it's like the sun kills the moon and then the moon kills the sun. We saw that in the Gregor fight. Gregor is the moon, the moon mountain, uh, and Oberyn, obviously, the sun with his sun spear. He stabs Gregor with a killing blow, and Gregor falls down to the earth. But then what happens? The smoking fist just like a mushroom cloud, rises up to punch the face of the sun and destroy it. It's, it's the best mythical astronomy. It's literally the mushroom cloud rising up and blotting out the face of the sun. It's the revenge, because he's already dead. He's already been hit with that poison spear. His death is certain. He's on the ground, but the revenge of the moon. And so I think that 
that theme that we see over and over, the moon's revenge on the sun. Now I want a croissant. <laughs> Could very well be <laughs> Night's Queen uh, creating the others out of Azor High's magic, essentially. So turning the tables, <laughs> getting revenge. We're one sentence in. Let's keep reading. Red leaves whispered in the wind. Dark clouds filled the skies and turned to storms. Like I said, you know. Lightning flashed and thunder rumbled. Oh, I almost started singing a, a 90s song. <laughs> Lightning crashes. I'm oh, sorry. I did start singing it. And dead men with black hands. I'm very stoned. I'll just admit it. Okay? That's what's going on here. I'm sorry. I'll try to get it together. Dead men with black hands and bright blue eyes shuffled around a cleft in the hillside. That sounds sexual. But could not enter. Under the hill... The broken boy sat upon a weird throne, listening to whispers in the dark as ravens walked up and down his arms. I told Tim I was going to take one giant rip before we started, didn't I, Tim? I was like, it's going to be huge. Yeah, you did. I did. And, and, uh, and if you're going to rely on me, well, you, if you're going to rely on me to save that, well, you saw the brownie tweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, boy. Oh, those. Oh. I see. Those are weirwood brownies. Were There's they? just walnuts. Walnuts. <laughs> all you see is all hearsay. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. I will have to get all this right, together well, then. All right. So under the hill. Yeah, go ahead. I was just gonna say because Blood Raven's coming up, and I know you're gonna want to voice them. Oh, well, as Maynard Plum, right? <laughs> yeah. Of course. <laughs> I figured that's how we would we would twist the chapters. I would voice him as Maynard Plum. <laughs> he speaks a little faster, you know. I'll have to add some insults and some f bombs, but I'm sure I can do it. All right. So here's the important part. Under the hill, the broken boy sat upon a weird throne, listening to the whispers in the dark as ravens walked up and down his arms. That's Bran the Wizard. Oh, it's tempting. I won't. I'll just do regular. You will never walk again. The three-eyed crow had promised, but you will fly. Sometimes the sound of song would drift up from someplace far below. The children of the forest. Old Nan would have called the singers, but those who sing the song of earth was their own name for themselves in the true tongue that no human man could speak. The ravens could speak it, though. Their small black eyes were full of secrets and they would caw at him and peck his skin when they heard the songs. So, I kind of forgot about this paragraph. This is, this is some interesting info dump here. Um, the ravens can speak the true tongue. That's interesting. Um, I know there's something in the World of Ice and Fire about the original first men didn't write down messages. They taught the ravens to speak their messages and it's implied that that might have been skin changer magic. Um, but here we see the ravens can actually speak the true tongue. What does that mean? Yeah, and I, I think that could be a reference to how ravens can mimic speech. Like, ra ravens are very smart birds. Um, but yeah, like... The when smartest they say that they can... of birds. <laughs> Even smarter than parrots, don't tell Cleo. They are. Though. They are. Ravens are incredible. Oh, is George is George implying though that like the ravens in Westeros are a magical creature like the dire wolves and they are a little more than our ravens? Or is it that the children of the forest have been skin changing the ravens for thousands of years and so they all have children inside them and have been conditioned to it? Something like that, maybe. Yeah, it could be like um, if children had been skin changing ravens as like their go to, then generations after, uh, even though they're no, even though current ravens are still no are no longer being skin changed, there might be something just in their blood that remembers that remembers from like ancest ancestral ravens from the past that were skin changed. And no, Kirsty, it wouldn't be all children of the forest. It would only be the ones that are green seers or skin changers and have skin changed ravens. Most children of the forest are not skin changers. That's a that's still a rare gift among them. So, 
the the regular children they just go into the rocks and trees and and all that stuff although i suspect even that afterlife could be tied to the weirwood somehow but it might just be the you know earth and nature itself yeah so cold hands definitely does speak the old tongue um does that imply something about cold hands no human could speak no i don't think it's that literal of a statement i just think that humans don't remember how to speak it um the thens do though the thens can speak um uh, mance raider speaks a little bit of the old tongue you have to speak the old tongue to speak to the giants um so leathers speaks the old tongue so wildlings some wildlings speak it and cold hand speaks it um but the thing is, there's not any, nobody south of the wall speaks the old tongue. Unless Mance Raider goes over the wall. So it really is a lost art. So I think that suggests that, that's why I say cold hands might be very, very old. Because to be a, a Night's Watchman who spoke the old tongue, yeah, that's like more than a couple hundred years ago. So, yeah. Uh, the Wally Bone Jangle, yeah, they do, they speak the old tongue on Skagos. And maybe some of the mountain clans do, like they might be bilingual in that way. I think the important thing, though, is the fact that the Starks don't. And that is another disconnect of the, of the Starks from their supposed first man heritage, is the fact that they don't speak the old tongue. Now, the old tongue and the true tongue, are these the same thing? I might have made a slip there. The old tongue is the oldest language of the first men. Maybe that's not the same as the true tongue. The true tongue would be the language of the children. Let's look it yeah, up. I bet, I bet that's what it is. Yeah, because it is later in the chapter when Bran will comment on the language of the children of how uh, and why they have to give them those names that they give them because to him, their language isn't even speakable like it, it's so complicated so yes the you true tongue is the language it. of the children um and oh god fucking ads um so this is the one that is meant to sounds like the wind through the leaves or rain on the water or the sound of stones in a brook so it's these are the it's a voice a language of nature sounds so it makes sense that the ravens can speak it it's it's kind of george okay so george is implying there's a universal language that like animals and the children can speak that's a nature language that mankind doesn't understand so bran the builder then would be the only human that's ever been taught the language of the children of the forest possibly if that legend means you know something so literal that might just mean he became a green seer um but yeah i mean maybe blood raven can speak it um and maybe bran will learn how to speak the true tongue but yeah cold hand speaks the old tongue and the thens speak the old tongue which is different so okay very interesting <clears throat> All right, uh, let's see here. The Ravens could speak it, though. Yeah, They're so small. yeah, the Ravens, yeah, okay. You want to pick it up with the moon is fat and full? Sure. The moon was fat and full. Stars wheeled across a black sky. Rain fell and froze, and tree limbs snapped from the weight of the ice. Bran and Mira made up names for those who sang the song of Earth. Ash and leaf and scales black knife and snowy locks and coals their true names were too long for human tongues said leaf only she could speak the common tongue so what the others thought of their new names brand never learned okay so ash leaf and scales so anytime we have ash that's always we're always looking at right there ash trees ash uh, ash shy all that but that <laughs> would be of scale. course the, the symbolism but i wonder mm -hmm. if because one is called snowy locks, which is obviously means white hair, could Ash possibly have silver hair? Is that what I wonder? Like why would, why, like symbolism, yes, Ash tree, but why would Bran nickname? See, they made up names for him that are descriptive. 
right? Mm -hmm. The first one they meet, they call Leaf because they notice the leaves in the hair. And they're like, wow, that's interesting. They all have that. But the first one they met, they called Leaf. So scales tells us that they've got some lizard scales. I'll try to not to use my nimble dick voice, but that just means they have scales among their sort of animal-like body parts. Coles is obviously the eyes because we know that their eyes are golden and bright and, you know, liquid and stuff. So they would glow in the dark. And uh, if one of them is, you know, a skin changer, then they might have red or green eyes. But so perhaps, perhaps that perhaps Coles has red eyes. Um, Black knife obsidian. It's really, mm -hmm. yeah. So ash, what do you think? Could be silver hair. Possibly. Or it could be, maybe maybe they just need lotion and they have that ashy skin tone. Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. <clears throat> Is Snowy Locks men, meant to make us think of Goldilocks? Um, I'm not sure how, because again, Goldilocks is this protagonist character who stumbles into a world she doesn't understand. And the children of the forest aren't really doing that. So probably not, unless Bran is the Goldilocks character. Um, I'd have to think about that. But no, Snowy Locks tells us they have white hair. Yeah. And um, so it might just be it's more that we need to see more of their interactions uh, to see why exactly that Snowy Locks is a more fitting name rather because right now it mainly seems to be just solely upon their hair color, but it could have something more to do with their personality or their mannerisms or something like that. Yeah, not hair color, but physical description. So like the mm -hmm. one called Black Knife probably carving you know whittling knives or something like that um yeah bran is stumbling into the world he doesn't understand yeah all right so um yeah there's the names uh rain fell and froze and tree limbs snapped from the weight of the ice so there's your ice spiders there those trees are getting weighed down by the ice to the point where the, they're breaking so that's also giving us like Breaking the weirwood net symbolism. After the bone grinding cold of the lands beyond the wall, the caves were blessedly warm, Tim. And when the chill crept out of the rock, the singers would light fires to drive it off again. Down here, there was no wind, no snow, no ice, no dead things reaching out to grab you. Only dreams and rush light and the kisses of the ravens and the whisperer in the darkness. The last green seer, the singers called him, but in Bran's dreams, he was still a three-eyed crow. When Mira Reed had asked him his true name, he made a ghastly sound that might have been a chuckle. I wore many names <laughs> when I was quick. When I was Maynard Plum, I had many jokes. But even I once had a mother, and the name she gave me at her breast was Brendan. I have an uncle, Brendan, Bran said. He's my mother's uncle. Brendan Blackfish, he's called. Your uncle may have been named for me. Some are still. Not so many as before. Men forget. Only the trees remember. His voice was so soft that Bran had to strain to hear. So, let's just stop and kill one of my least favorite theories real quick. Let's beat it with a stick. In Bran's dreams, he was still a three-eyed crow. Okay. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. Bran talks to Bloodraven in the physical world, then they go into the dream world and continue their lessons. And Bran knows that that is Bloodraven. Why? Because they have a running dialogue. And the running dialogue starts in Bran's dreams, where the three-eyed crow is saying all the same things that Blood Raven is saying to him because it's part of a running conversation between Bran and Blood Raven. Now, as I've said, people do not control how they appear to others in dreams. 
John sees Bran as a tree with Bran's face that has a branch that reaches out and touches John kind of like a hand. Bran didn't necessarily create that vision. It's just what John's dream brain saw because Bran is coming to him, touching him through weird magic. Okay, so when Bran says, are you the three-eyed crow? And Bloodraven's like, a crow? Huh? Oh, I used to be a Night's Watch crow. And everyone's like, aha, it's not him. No, it's just that Bloodraven isn't necessarily in control of how he appears to Bran. And right here, you can see that Bran knows that the three-eyed crow is Bloodraven and that they have an ongoing tutoring that is partly in the physical world and partly in the dream world. But in the dream world, Blood Raven is always a three-eyed crow. So take your somebody else's the three-eyed crow theories and, I don't know, let's put them on the shelf in retirement somewhere. We don't have to burn them, but they're not true. So your thoughts, Tim? Am I over-interpreting or you see it that way too? Uh, well, I was like thinking, because someone had brought up uh, the Whisperer in the Darkness line, and that is uh, a Lovecraft connection. Oh. Another one, which is literally the Whisperer in Darkness. And the story of that is of uh, these extraterrestrials that have the ability to, uh, they can surgically extract a human brain and place it into a canister so that it can live indefinitely to withstand space travel. So when we think of here, uh, Blood Raven being sort of artificially kept alive by the Weirwood net, like just because he's, you know, like he should be at least a hundred something by this point in the timeline being kept alive through that. And then the idea of uh, skin changing humans, that becomes like a motif for all of this. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and this is how George weaves together his influences. Like it's always hard to tell where the, where he starts a parallel relationship. Like he's probably already working with weirwoods and stuff and sees that, the Green Seer is kind of like the Whisper in the Darkness. And so he goes ahead and uses that label and enhances the parallel. Um, but yeah, it's like there's so many things that go into the idea of Blood Raven and the Weirwood Trees. Obviously, Odin and Yggdrasil, but there's tons more than that, too. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a complex tapestry, and we have fun peeling it apart. But yeah, I would, I would love it if Blood Raven's body got digested and it would just be a brain held in some roots that would be fun <laughs> there is one going into his eye socket so the roots in his brain for sure mm -hmm. like sometimes it does give the interpretation that th this might not be fully brendan rivers like he might not have full control of his faculties and that part of what's keeping him alive is actually the tree speaking for him like just how we said the birds remember, the bones remember. Um, if the trees rem if the trees remember, like Bryn like he says they do, then the the trees might remember Blood Raven or actually more like puppet puppeteering him than anything. There is a range of possibilities. Um, Blood Raven, when he's in the physical world. He's only there for a little bit, and he's like, oh, I really got to go. The trees are calling me. You know, I'm tired and stuff. Mm -hmm. Like, So he is in the process of being subsumed into the weirwood net. I think that his physical state reflects his spiritual state, wouldn't you say? It's halfway in. So, there, yeah, he is merging with the weirwood net slowly, and there is a question of how much Blood Raven is there. I tend to think it's mostly Blood Raven, when he's talking, but there's definitely some gray area there. So, yeah. Yeah. Cause with going back to whisper and darkness, the end of that story, our two main characters, Will Marth and Ackley, it ends with Will Marth returning to Ackley's room and finding Ackley's discarded hands and face. And he comes to the conclusion that something was wearing his face in order to disguise itself as a man. So the idea here would be the Weirwoods are wearing Brynden and disguising themselves as a man through Brynden. Um, 
Yeah. So I think like he's he's really leaving it out in the open as to whether or not how just how alive Blood Raven still is and how much of this is being done under his own power and how much is the tree or possibly the children in the trees controlling him and just like using him to try and get Bran to be their next one. Like he's all used up. We need a new one. Okay, that's interesting. I see what your point is. So calling him the Whisper in the Darkness is potentially implying that he is a mask somebody is wearing, which would be the weird mm -hmm. net itself. Um, or the the thing is, the hive mind that's in the weird net is not the tree mind. The original tree mind is now the others. That's what got scooped out of there. And that's why the trees look like whites, bone and blood and screaming faces and stuff. Their brains have been scooped out. So this is my theory anyways. And so the, the hive mind that's in there now is made up of like all the human green seers that have ever used the trees since then from the time of Azor Ahai. Um, and that is what is like what Blood Raven is being merged into. It's still the weirwood net in the sense that like the, the architecture is the, it's a, you know, it's a hard drive that got wiped. Okay, so the hard drive itself is still the weirwood net, but it got wiped of data. And the new data that's in there now is are the humans. The old data got stored on an external drive, which is made of ice. <laughs> and that is the others. That's why they're a hive mind and they're like walking trees. So, yeah. Um, we don't know, like what that personality of the human green seer hive mind is. Like, that's not... I'd like to think that it's Azor High is in there and he's learned his lesson and that they're now custodians of this horrible problem that Azor High made. Like, Blood Raven and Bran are babysitting a problem until it can be fixed. Yeah. That's how yeah. I see it. Yeah, that's how I see it, too, because, like, when we were talking last week, the idea of Azor Ahai invading the Weirwood Net, but the Weirwood Net instead trapping him and him, like, Again, him not getting, like, he does it, but he doesn't get what he wants because the trees actually overtake him instead of him overtaking the trees. Well, if he becomes, like, then, if he ends up in a situation like Blood Raven where he becomes this, like, sort of first life battery, but then enough years go by and he's been drained, he could have just, it could mean that Azor Ahai becomes the first in a long series of, of like human batteries that the that the weirwood net now has to lure new people to get there in order and and it needs to be the battery needs to be changed something like Brendan's that running, yeah brendan's running out they need a new one yeah and 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 but they're sort of again babysitting a mistake that goes back to the human invasion of the weirwood net so yeah, yeah. the children yeah. and the green seers like brendan are managing a bad situation until it can be fixed. I, I I do see it that way. I like how you put that. And um, people in the chat are talking about the green seers impaled in Brand's dream on ice spires. That's just a visual metaphor of the original weirwood net green seer hive mind getting kicked thrown out the window. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's analogous to people who get kicked out of the moon door in the Eerie, which is a frozen ice castle with a weirwood door of death that you fall out of and die on the Blue Mountain. So that's similar. It's like flying and falling are the same thing. Bran, if he doesn't fly, he'll fall and be impaled. So that just tells you that those impaled other dreamers, those are others and green seers both which means the others were green seers, but again, they got thrown out the window essentially. So. And let's see here. Okay. So where were we? So, uh, your uncle, we, the last part was your uncle may have been named for me. Yeah. Because, so Brendan Blackfish as a river as a Riverlander and because Brendan Rivers is from the Riverland. So yeah, so Brendan being a name like that would be interesting if the Blackfish, if Brendan Rivers is his namesake, if the Tull because the Tullys may have had 
Tully's probably had huge respect for Brendan Rivers as the hand of the king, as a Riverlander representing the crown. So it could be a point of pride in Riverland culture. I think so. And Blackwood is leashed to Tully. They probably have a good relationship. It seems like they yeah. might. So. Better than the brackets. <laughs> okay, so go ahead with most of him. Uh, most of him has gone into the tree, explained the singer Mira called Leaf. He has lived beyond his mortal span, and yet he lingers. For us, for you, for the realms of men. Only a little strength remains in his flesh. He has a thousand eyes in one, but there is much to watch. One day you will know. So yeah, that like kind of cements what I've been saying about how like, yeah, but he's he's running out, he's used up. Like he's he's got he doesn't have much strength left in him to continue doing this job he's doing. Yeah, I wish George had given us more clues about who might have been in this position before, either before Blood Raven or at any time. Yeah. There just aren't any. There really are not. Yeah, because um, it's like because if, if Blood Raven's the one who who like let out sent out the feelers that caught Brand's attention and led Brand, well then who's the one who's the one that caught Blood Raven's attention and made him real made him think like, oh, I gotta go range, I gotta go on a great ranging beyond the wall. Like something must have signaled to him for him to get there. Oh, I I have lately come to think that Leaf wed Blood Raven to the trees while he was still alive down in Westeros when he was Hand of the King. Um, mm. I think that's one of the things that Leaf would have been doing during her time out in the world is doing is initiating Blood Raven, probably down in the High Heart Cave or something like, or maybe under the Blackwood Tree. Who knows? Um, real quick, because it's going around in the chat. Somebody did use AI to try to write the end of A Song of Ice and Fire. I have very strong feelings about AI. I think it's all bad when it comes to replacing any kind of art. AI surgery algorithms are probably fine, um, you know, uh, but any sort of AI art, quote unquote, images, books, literature, strongly against it. I believe that everybody should be strongly against it who values art. I think it's very simple, like any amount of AI art is replacement of artists. <laughs> um, so no one should read that. Um, and of course it's gonna be terrible. People who watch this channel uh, know better than anyone that you can't just mimic the prose. Like it won't have the theme work, it won't have the symbolism. No, even a human author couldn't mimic A Song of Ice and Fire. So. The AI version is, it's an abomination. That's what it is. And uh, no one should read it. I definitely will not allow any discussion of it. And I would encourage everyone to, if you don't feel as strongly as me, I would challenge you to think hard about the topic until you feel this way because it's all bad. And shame on, Shame on Westeros.org for putting AI art images, art, AI images uh, on their wiki. That is an abomination. So, moving right along. <laughs> You'll regret calling it an abomination when the machines take over. Yeah, I know we've all seen the movies. <clears throat> but um, we don't need to diverge into a whole discussion of it. I, most of you probably agree with me um, to some extent. Maybe not quite as white hot, but you guys know I get emotional. So, yep, yeah. definitely. Um, and I've, I, I think the way to say it is like, George, it takes 10 years, 12 years to write A Song of Ice and Fire because it's a masterwork. You guys know I love Tool. I love Rage Against the Machine. Bands like that, Radiohead, they go years between albums. No one else can do it. AI can't make you a new Tool album. You just have to wait. Because it's, that's what's special about it. And it's the same with Song of Ice and Fire. No, it's not just another brush in the artist's arsenal. That's terrible. That's a terrible idea. It's not at all. It is not. It's a replacement of artists. Feeding prompts into an algorithm is not art. Uh, yeah, so. AI, is a cr AI is a crutch for those who are unable to create themselves. That is exactly what it is. And it also looks bad. I will just say <laughs> it's oh, the God, Terminator yeah. draws like make have no illusion. That's, that's what it is. It's the Terminator draws and it's not cute. 
And uh, <laughs> if that offends you, that's fine. I don't really care. That's that's how I feel. About yeah. it. So, I mean, I just think it's something that like we this is our battleground. We consume art. We buy art. We use art. I put art on my channel. You all enjoy art. I have artists on my channel. We interview them and appreciate them. If we are not taking a stand on this issue, then no one fucking will. Okay. Um, you see, it's part of the Hollywood uh, writer's strike things, which George supports and which I support. They Hollywood studios want to be able to take an, an actor's likeness, capture it in one day, pay them for one day, and then spin out AI images of their acting and for multiple scenes. That's yeah, what people want to do with this stuff. Did you have something to say, Tim? Oh no, I was just say in, in perpetuity. So like they want to be able to take what pay them for one day's worth worth of work and then use their likeness forever as a background character or whatever it is they need, but they'll they'll own that likeness of a person and be able to use it forever. Yeah, and it is obviously morally wrong, but the studios are literally throwing down and they're willing to lose money to try to fight for this right. Like it is this is, this is why this writer's strike is serious business. It's why it might go on for a little bit because like the stuff that the studios are trying to get is awful and wrong and evil and they really do have to be stopped. And that's why we're seeing the strike escalate with more unions joining it. So I want House of the Dragon as soon as anyone else does, but of course this is a bigger, a much bigger issue. And that's why you see George unambiguously. So I even saw him talk about, he, he's not happy that they're still, um, they've got European actors still working on House of the Dragon. He's very upset that they can't exercise their rights to strike because they have different guild rules over there. He's not happy about that. So that's where George is on it. And, uh, yeah, so we probably spent enough time on that, but yeah, we got a story to read. All right. Um, so I was me meaning to address the strike, so um, good to get that in. Oh, uh, pick it up. Let me. What take will this I? One. Yeah. What will I know? Bran asked the reeds afterwards when they came with torches burning brightly in their hand to carry him back to a small chamber off the big cavern where the singers had made beds for them to sleep. What did the trees remember? The secrets of the old gods, said Jojen Reed. Food and, food and fire and rest had helped restore him after the ordeals of their journey. But he seemed sadder now, sullen, with a weary, haunted look about the eyes. Truths the first men knew, forgotten now in Winterfell, but not in the wet wild. We live closer to the green in our bogs and crannogs, and we remember. Earth and water, soil and stone, oaks and elms and willows. They were here before us all and will still remain when we are gone. That's interesting. Um, you know, we hear people talk about the Cranog men mostly. So that's interesting. Not in the wet wild. We live closer to the green. It's a very vague statement, you know, closer mm -hmm. to the green. Does that mean closer to the children? You know, well, the, the things that he's describing earth and stone, uh, soil and stone, oaks and elms. These are the same, ex in, in not so many words, they're the same things that Blood Raven will later tell Bran the things that a tree remembers because a tree doesn't know time. A tree doesn't know that a year or a century has passed. Those don't mean anything to a tree. Uh, but water, soil, nutrients, those are what mean things to a tree. And Jojen's kind of saying the same thing for the Cranog men. Right. Okay, yeah, so I do think it's a more a general statement on them just living more in harmony with the earth. Yeah. And, and that's what I was saying about what George is saying with the true tongue. It's like a secret means of communication between animals and the children who are halfway between animals and people and elves and whatever else. So Yeah, and it's They're another way of drawing... It's another way of drawing a parallel to the Cranog men and the children. Like, if Starks are blood of the other, blood of the others, then houses like the Reeds are blood of the children. The Cranog men being a sort of children human hybrid. Yep. They, um, like I said, Brand needs to, <laughs> Brand needs to look for tails. I bet they have tails. What do you guys think? Do the children of the forest have little fluffy tails back there? I think, I, I bet, I think they do. I think they have tails. 
I'd be surprised if they didn't. Not long ones, but just little ones. Little deer tails or something. Anyway, um, uh, so you, oh, you just finished Sad Jojen's speech. I'll do Mira. Okay. So will you, said Mira. That made Bran sad. What if I don't want to remain when you are gone? He almost asked, but he swallowed the words unspoken. He was almost a man grown, and he did not want to think, want Mira to think he was some weepy babe. Love that. Uh, maybe, maybe you could be maybe. Green Seers too, he said instead. No, Bran. Now Mira sounded sad. Go ahead, Jojen. Oh. It is given to a few that drink of that green fountain while still in mortal flesh to hear the whisperings of the leaves and see as the trees see, as the gods see, said Jojen. Most are not so blessed. The gods gave me only green dreams. My task was to get you here. My part in this is done. Oh, that's ominous. When a character tells you, like... It's one thing for us to analyze somebody's role and be like, oh, I think they're going to die soon. I think they're kind of did what they need to do now. They're probably mm -hmm. going to get off. Jojen, it's all like, yeah, I'm expendable now, really. Yeah. And that's what and it's like Jojen. It's like Jojen knows he's going to die and he's trying to make peace with that. But, you know, you, you really can't to know that like, if you can foresee your own death, most most people would probably do all they can to avoid that. Jojen's accepting it, but that doesn't mean that he's comfortable with it, I guess is what we would say here. Yeah, it's hard to read this in any other way than that, I would say. So like I know I'm know I'm gonna die, but I don't want to die. I'm afraid to die. <laughs> Lonk the lunk with an office reference. Yeah, it stares into camera, yeah. My part in this <laughs> is done. Yeah. The moon was a black hole in the sky. Um, so this is interesting when the moon, you can never actually see the moon as a black hole in the sky unless Planetos' moon works differently than ours. I'll just say that it's because of astronomy, but, um, it's like below the horizon and I, for, I forget what this line is weird. It's. What I'm saying is, like, he's writing this. He wants the moon to be a black hole. This is long night talk. Like, the moon doesn't... You don't see the moon as a black hole in front of yeah, stars. Even, like, you, you don't see that. Yeah, the closest we get to that is the new moon phase, where the moon is completely darkened, but it's not a black hole. Yeah, but the new moon, the way... I'm not in a... Uh, I know. I, I can't remember it anymore. How does it work? Because every time they say, like, the moon, the moon was... Uh, the moon was a crescent, thin and sharp. It makes us think it's either in the waxing crescent or the waning crescent fa uh, phase. Okay. So when... Yeah. When the moon, it's when the moon aligns with the position of the sun and it's in between us and the sun. So the new moon is the only time when there can be a solar eclipse. But unless the moon is in front of the sun, it is invisible because it will be up during the day. It's basically a day moon that's near the sun. So that's why you never actually see a new moon in the night sky blacking out stars. You never see that. And that's why, because it's in the same spot as the sun. A new moon appears during the day, and then it's invisible. So it's not blacking out anything. So either, either Martin doesn't realize that, and is just thinking of a new moon and picturing it as a black circle in front of the stars, even though that doesn't actually happen. Because again, I thought it did happen. I had to look this up to realize that, oh yeah, that never does happen. So either George is doing sloppy astronomy or the moon works differently somehow here or, and this is my guess, he wrote this to be poetic because it is the moon that blocks out the sun during the long night and that makes it like a black hole. It eats stars. It eats the sun. It is the source of the darkness. So that is why he wrote it to be a black hole, but yeah. 
Anyway, astronomy lesson concluded. <laughs> I just had to point that out because it is weird. Like that's not a real thing that happens. <laughs> the balance beans bookkeeping because the moon is clearly a black hole. Thank you. Thanks for that PayPal. <laughs> All right, so a black hole in the sky. Wolves howled in the wood, sniffing through snow drifts after dead things. A murder of ravens erupted from the hillside, screaming their sharp, sharp cries, black wings beating above a white world. So that murder of a ravens, that black eruption from the hillside, that's, this is all astronomy. So the moon is a black hole, and then the murder of ravens erupts from the hill, the hill being a moon symbol. But the eruption of the black wings, and they're going to describe the blackness of the wings in a minute, like black as pitch, black as night, black as the abyss. So it's an eruption of darkness. That is what comes from the moon. Um, and the erupt, that's a big word, like erupting from the hillside. Like it, it screams explosion, you know. Black wings beating above a white world. And then that, that sort of blows the scale up, above a white world. So it, now it sounds like the ravens are covering the world, right? A red sun rose and set and rose again, painting the snows in shades of rose and pink. Azor Ahai is bleeding out on the snow is what's happening there. Under the hill, Jojen brooded, Mira fretted, and Hodor wandered through dark tunnels with a sword in his right hand and a torch in his left. Or was it Bran wandering? And that's Mithras symbolism. Sword in the torch. And Mithras symbolism is used for Azor Ahai, but specifically the, the Mithrams were always in caves and in crypts. That's where the, the members of the cult of Mithras always met. And so when Bran is down in the cave, this is paralleling Azor Ahai in the Weirwood Net. So this is Mithras in the cave with the sword and the torch. That's Azor Ahai in the Weirwood Net, in the darkness, trying to find his way. And that's what Bran and Hodor are doing. They're mimicking that here. And that's why. The Mithra symbolism. Let's see here. Or was it Bran wandering? And then it says in italics, no one must ever know. So Bran knows it's wrong. Okay, right there. That tells you. Skin changing Hodor is what they're talking about. So listen to this. The great cavern that opened on, to the, opened on the abyss was as black as pitch, black as tar, blacker than the feathers of a crow. Light entered as a trespasser, unwanted and unwelcome, and soon was gone again. Cook fires, candles, and rushes burned for a little while, then guttered out, their brief lives at an end. So there's a lot of blackness, just poetic descriptions of blackness. The moon is a black hole, the eruption of the black wings, and now the abyss. So light is not having a good day in this chapter. Go ahead and, and uh, take over here. Right. Oh, I do just want to point out this oh, yeah. whole idea of light entering as a trespasser, unwanted, unwelcome. This is more Lovecraft talk, and this refers to two things. First is uh, the Haunter in the Dark, uh, which uh, the Haunter in the Dark is uh, Niar Lahotep, and it, it, it thrives in darkness, but it can be defeated by light. So it is always looking for every way to snuff out light. And second is Nefren Ka, who is that black pharaoh with the black sarcophagus. His tomb is specifically built into a set of crypts, which are designed to keep out all light. So it is shrouded in complete darkness. So George is, I think George is drawing on there with the idea of light is not one unwanted, unwelcome. That's it, just to preserve the finish, man. That coffin has a nice finish on it. They're not trying to let the sun. <laughs> I mean, have you ever seen a guitar? That's like, you know, in the window of the shop, like it's bad, man. You don't want to do that. So <laughs> just like that. It's just like that. Um, we had a so, at guitar center. We had one black guitar that we kept in a back chamber in total darkness. Um, <laughs> so you can only play black metal on it, of course. <laughs> bad joke. Sorry. I did used to work at guitar center, though. OK, so I'll pick it up. Yeah, the singers. Yeah. The singers made Bran a throne of his own, like the one Lord Brendan sat. White weirwood flecked with red, dead branches woven through living roots. They placed it in the great cavern by the abyss, 
where the black air echoed to the sound of running water far below. Of soft gray moss, they made his seat. Once he had been lowered into place, they covered him with warm furs. There he sat, listening to the hoarse whispers of his teacher. Never fear the darkness, Bran. The Lord's words were accompanied by a faint rustling of wood and leaf, a slight twisting of his head. Which I find endearing, by the way. Like, Blood Raven talks and there's a little... <laughs> the strongest trees are rooted in the dark places of the earth. Darkness will be your cloak, your shield, your mother's milk. Darkness will make you strong. That's not creepy but again, at all. What, exactly. This is where... But you see, like, this is the point we're getting at about this is not just like some teacher and some protege. When your mentor tells you to embrace darkness, these are not good things. And I know George is all about subverting our expectations, but I really don't think that embracing darkness can have any real good ramifications to come out of it. I'm sorry. Like, that's, I still stand on that one, so... Yeah, not quite, um, not quite so sure on that Blood Raven's working towards the real greater good sometimes. It's hard to know if how much George is just making his actual good advice givers kind of edgy. Like, I think mm -hmm. that's what's going on with Quay. That she's basically a very straightforward character giving Danny good advice about facing the others, but George just made it all creepy so that we doubt it and it's more interesting. I do think there could be some of that going on, but I'm not yeah. in disagreement with you either. This is suspect. It reminds me of also Melisandre, like, you know, um, talking about yeah. darkness and light and shadow and shadows are servants of the light. I was like, this sounds like some mental gymnastics to me. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I could I could be wrong, but it is really hard to shake off the let the hate flow through you vibes that this whole thing is giving off. <laughs> I didn't think about that, but you're not wrong. That You're not wrong, at least vibe-wise. And of course, Quaid specifically talks to Danny about, you know, to reach the light, you must pass beneath the shadow. So... Oh, and Karsnark's bringing up the lyrics from Metallica's one, and that is... Like Darkness, with the way President May, is, all that I see. All that I see. <laughs> yeah, well, with the way with the way Brendan's so basically decomposed, he is like he is like the guy in Johnny Got His Gun. Almost, he's he's a living corpse. I cannot live. I cannot die. Trapped in myself, my body, my only cage. Oh yeah, that's uh... yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Oh, that's that Gene Cranks, dude. If you haven't listened to old Metallica young young people, I'm not a Metallica fan, by the way, but if you haven't taken that old shit and turned it up on the stereo once or twice, like you got to understand what was going on back then. Anyway, moving right along. That's vicious. That is a vicious tune. Now I got it in my head. Okay, the horse whispers. Yes, Yggdrasilus Odin's horse. So Blood Raven, the horse whispers, definitely Yggdrasil whispers. Sure. Um, the moon was a crescent, thin and sharp as the blade of a knife. Snowflakes drifted down soundlessly to cloak the soldier pines and sentinels in white. Oh, God. Mm -hmm. That sounds like creation of the others, Tim. The yeah, drifts grew so to... deep that they covered the entrance to the caves, leaving a white wall that Summer had to dig through whenever he went outside to join his pack and hunt. Bran did not oft range with them in those days, but some nights he watched them from above. So... Someone commented that Summer is outside the cave. Summer goes back and forth. That's what I was saying. And you can see it here. Goes back and forth. Um, interesting. Bran likes to fly. It says flying was even better than climbing. So he doesn't go into Summer that much even anymore. It's like kind of sad. It's like Toy Story. The old toy that the kid doesn't play with as much. You know, he's, he's got ravens and trees now. It's a little bit sad. Um so slipping into summer skin had become as easy for him as slipping on a pair of breeches once had been, before his back had broken. Changing his own skin for a raven's night black feathers had been harder, but not as hard as he had feared. Not with these ravens. 
A wild stallion will buck and kick when a man tries to mount him and tried to bite the hand that slips the bit between his teeth, Lord Brynden said. But a horse that has known one rider will accept another. Young or old, these birds have all been ridden. Choose one now and fly. He Pick it up. I'm, I need a new drink for this Blood Raven voice here. Sure. He chose one bird and then another without success. But the third raven looked at him with shrewd black eyes, tilted its head and gave a quirk. And quick as that, he was not a boy looking at a raven, but a raven looking at a boy. The song of the river suddenly grew louder. The torches burned a little brighter than before, and the air was full of strange smells. When he tried to speak, it came out in a scream, and his first flight ended when he crashed into a wall and ended back inside his own broken body. The raven was unhurt. It flew to him and landed on his, or on his arm, and brain... Sh bra brain. Bran stroked its feathers and slipped inside of it again. Before long, he was flying around the cavern, weaving through the long stone teeth that hung down from the ceiling, even flapping out over the abyss and swooping down into its cold black depths. So let's pause right there because a bunch of crap just happened. This chapter's loaded. We haven't even gotten the visions. Okay, so first of all, the visual on this of the perspective flip from the boy to the raven if you've ever seen the movie The Crow, that's what they do with this. When the crow, he can see through the eyes of the crow, and they do some nice cinematography where it literally, all of a sudden, the bird is looking back at the person. So that's what that made me think of. And uh, that movie might have been made by the time George, well, definitely by the time George wrote Dance, but even the first mm -hmm. books. That was mid mid nineties. Good yeah, been thinking about that. Like I wonder if there is crow stuff in ice and fire i've never thought about it but like he's very john snow like i mean they basically look the same <laughs> you put some black masking tape around john snow's torso and it's oh devoted to mariah's thought about this already of course 90s aficionado devoted to mariah <laughs> as in mariah carey makes sense yeah, we're learning a lot today. I'm not sure. Oh, the Crow comic also predates the film, and George is a comics fan. Good point, Guilty Undertaker. Yeah, the Crows see through the eyes. They extend his life. They bring him back. I just wonder if um, if there's some specific call-outs. Like, the guy's name is Eric Draven. Um, you know, something. Halloween until manana. Okay, all right. Back on track. Okay. <laughs> So the impo so here's the thing I want to get in on. Um, his first flight ended when he crashed into a wall and ended back inside his own broken body. What's going to crash into the wall? A comet. We know that. John's dream spells it out. Um, I mean, he's, he's got multiple foreshadowings, but the one where the moon is calling snow at him and then he wakes up and throws a white pillow at the raven and then there's an explosion against the wall a flurry of feathers so we've basically thrown the moon at the wall it's exploded into a snowstorm this is implying that that bran will have something to do potentially with calling the comet or steering the comet into the wall and again the two methods the two theories that we have for any sort of human magician steering a comet or summoning a comet or anything like that is the horns. The horns have a lot of clues about that. Or the weirwoods, because the weirwoods frequently are seen to be reaching up and trying to harm the moon, such as in Brand's Night Fort chapter, where the Night Fort weirwood looks like it wants to pull the moon down into the well. That is potentially, like I said a clue that weirwood magic was used to break the moon. So here we have Bran's first flight ended when he crashed into a wall and ended back inside his broken body. The raven was unhurt. It flew to him and landed on his arm. I just wonder if that's got something of crashing into a wall. Like, that's just not an innocuous turn of phrase. Like, we saw the moon door at the Eerie 
Remember it flapped open suddenly and slammed against the wall. Were you with me when we read that chapter? Or were uh, you watching? I probably was watching. I don't, I don't think we've done any eerie chapters together. Okay. Well, I made a big deal out of it because um, it, the, I've, I've never noticed it before. But yeah, it was the moon door slamming against the wall violently. So it's yet another weird, you know, it's the moon crashing against the wall, but it's a weirwood moon door. So it's the weirwood magic that crashes the moon against the wall. So that very well could involve Bran. Skin changing the comet is what Ravenous Reader calls this. Um, that seems a little crazy, but I guess if you're summoning the comet with weirwood magic, I, it could be called... See, Bran, the other clue about this is when he's overhearing Jamie and Cersei, which is the forbidden knowledge of the golden gods in that scene. He is ha he's riding the gargoyle. And gargoyles can be dragons sometimes. The Winterfell gargoyles are shapeless. But he hangs, first he's riding it, and then he swings upside down like a, like a Dothraki horse rider doing a trick, you know, hanging down off the horse, like a Com Comanche or something, Comanche horsemanship. Hanging off the side. Okay. So Bran is hanging below the gargoyle and the world is upside down and the world is swimming and there's all this language that implies Bran is actually flying over the world. Then in, in Bran's coma dream, he's also flying over the world as if he were the comet. And the comet appears shortly after that. So Ravenous Reader, again, my friend who likes Bran's will skin change the comet theory thinks that Bran was literally looking out the comet's eyes there, potentially in that dream, or, or that that's being implied. So. Far-fetched, yes, but it does, there's a lot of clues about weirwoods pulling the moon down and about human magicians calling comets and things. So, yeah. I don't think Bran will do that on purpose, but maybe the comet needs to come. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, the idea of Bran doing it, like, what the two possibilities I see are Euron blows the horn and does it on purpose, or, yeah, Bran somehow does it accidentally, the way Daenerys might burn King's Landing accidentally by hitting wildfire caches, but... I don't know, seeing through the eyes of the comet, that just, that just made me think of, like, Majora's Mask the moon with its huge creepy face and it's going to crash into the planet. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people have shared yeah. that with me. That is a good one. Um, so yeah, this, I somehow didn't fit this in e any of my icebergs, but this is like a bottom of the iceberg theory for sure. For sure. Way down there. Brand's gonna see these clues could be about brand skin changing a dragon. And that's initially what, we thought when we looked at him riding the gargoyle, because in the mm -hmm. dream, the gargoyle is very dragon-like. It, it, it has burning eyes and they come climbing down the tower at him. They come climbing down from the moon, by the way, Tim. The moon is at the top of the tower in his vision and the gargoyles are superimposed in front of it, walking down at him with the burning eyes. So they're very moon-like. Anyways, or they're, at least they're up in the sky next to the moon, I guess is what I should say. So Bran's riding them. Yeah. Who knows? Let's keep going. But uh, put a pin in it. <laughs> put a pin in it. Watch out in that weirwood net. You never know. I mean, that's the whole thing is that Bran doesn't know what he's doing. He's messing with powers. He doesn't understand. Blood Raven's not going to have time to teach him everything. And Bran is probably more powerful than Blood Raven because that's just how yeah. stories go, you know? In, in Majora's the Mask, the, in Majora's Mask, the moon is pulled down by a child of the forest. Man, I would laugh, though, if George is out playing Legend of Zelda games in his free time, though. I mean, <laughs> it's just, it's hard to tell where one person gets inspiration from somebody else or they're both pulling from the same place. But... The more you look around, the more you see the moon destruction ideas. Like, it's in the backstory of Dune. It's in Thundar. It's in... Um, we've found it all over the place. Like, once you're looking for yeah. the moon... It's just something that you do. It, 
you break the moon. It's up there. Why not? What happens if it broke? The idea, Just, you know, the idea of the idea of an old man hooked up to a tree, attended by plant people, and looking for a protege happens in Naruto of all things. Okay, so yeah, it is hard to know what in happens what? with these inspirations. In Naruto, oh, the ninja anime, Madara Uchiha is a is attached to a, a tree of life and has plant people attending him while he gets a crippled boy named Obito to become his protege. <laughs> that, that's that's Naruto. <laughs> yeah, um, the moon turns to blood in Revelation. A Norse myth: the wolves eat it. There's there's uh, star demons that come down from the eclipse in uh, Mesoamerican mythology. That's one of my favorites. There's um, there's a lot of good. But there's some good Japanese myths about the eclipses too. Mm -hmm. And then there's uh, the Egyptian the um, the Egyptian the uh, myth. I think it's the eyes of Khonsu. It's a god that loses one eye and then it's like replaced, you know. And that's the sun and moon. Like the moon disappears sometimes, and the sun is constant so that's anyway so brands flying in the ravens that's where we were then he realized he was not alone someone else was in the raven he told lord brendan once he returned to his own skin some girl i felt her Ooh. sorry i'm so i'm just i'm reading stuff in i should stop a woman of those who sing the song of earth his teacher said long dead yet a part of her remains just as a part of you would remain in summer if your boy's flesh were to die upon the morrow. A shadow on the soul. She will not harm you. Okay. So this is a possible reason why this chapter comes here. It need, this is more John foreshadowing, um, in addition to the Veramir prologue. Now, this chapter really only needs to come before John's death, but if it were right before John's death, maybe that would be too obvious. John's death is still like 25 chapters away, though. So, maybe. That could be one reason. It's definitely foreshadowing. It's giving us the mechanics, you know, along with the very much chapter of what to expect. Uh, go ahead and... Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I stole your brand. Go ahead and, and pick up brand again, and we'll do the back and forth. Uh, do all the birds have singers in them? All, Lord Brendan said. It was the singers who taught the first men to send messages by raven. But in those days, the birds would speak the words. The trees remember, but men forget. And Blood Raven repeats himself. He says that a lot. It's like one of his catchphrases. Trees remember, men forget. So now they write the messages on parchment and tie them round the feet of birds who have never shared their skin. Old man had told him the same story once, Bran remembered. But when he asked Rob if it was true, his brother laughed and asked him if he believed in Grumpkins, too. He wished Rob were there with him. I'd tell him I could fly, but he wouldn't believe, so I'd have to show him. I bet that he could learn to fly, too. Him and Arya and Sansa, even baby Rickon and Jon Snow. Yeah, just kind of throwing it out there that all the Stark kids are skin changers. We could all be ravens and live in Maester Lewin's rookery. <laughs> And this is a great job of George reminding us of Bran's youth. And you know what I mean? Like, it's hard to write a 10-year-old. But we as adult readers, like, all you really have to do is put in these sort of simple childlike thoughts. And it works to create that tension of like, oh, this wizard is 10. And he's like, oh, we could all be ravens that live in the rookery together. Like, that's something a 10-year-old. And it also expresses... His brokenheartedness, obviously, you know, his family is scattered to the wind and he's looking at, he thinks he's going to turn into Blood Raven. Like, I think we now have the idea based on the show and other clues that Bran will leave the Weirwood Cave. But right now, Bran is imagining that he's here forever to turn into a tree. And that's why he's like, I don't know if I want to outlive everyone. And so he's like, oh, we could all be ravens and live together. Like, this is supposed to be kind of heartbreaking as well as showing us Bran's innocence. Um, yeah. Also his good heartedness though. Like he's wishing for a happy ending for everyone. Like even though Bran is doing some things that are wrong, that he kind of knows are wrong, like stealing Hodor's body. We understand why he does that, A. 
And B, like we also see signs that he is a good hearted kid. So there is hope that Bran is like, I don't like the Bran is evil theories. You know, I do think that Bran could cause some trouble. Like the Hodoring is some version of the Hodoring is going to happen. And that's going to be essentially Bran messing with stuff. We don't know how much of that will be at the direct instruction of Blood Raven, where Blood Raven is like orchestrating it, or if it's going to be something that Blood Raven knows Bran will do on his own by messing with shit. We'll just have to see how it falls out. But yeah. Well, I think that becomes like one of the running themes here is that for, you know, for kids to, kids need guidance to become good people and that usually comes from their parents and the things they learn from them but what we have here with pretty much every stark child is since their parents since ned and catelyn are gone they are now being steered into new directions by other adults and they are being used they are not being seen as kids to be raised and molded they are being seen as pieces to be you uh, pieces to be used to advance other people's uh, agendas for Bran, it's blood Ra it's blood raven using brand to advance whatever it is he wants to advance for rickon it's going to be manderly who wants to use him sansa has little finger backing her aria has uh the uh the faceless men who are trying to steer her towards their goals so that that's the thing like all these are all young children being guided being pushed towards a, a, an agenda by other adults around them who do not have their best interest at heart. Yeah, you're completely right about that. And that is kind of the sense in which Quave and Blood Raven are. Yeah, it's like, are they looking out for Danny and Bran's best interest as human beings? Like, no. But are they trying to steer those people in the direction that they need to go to like save the world? Yes. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like, you know, we whoever Quave is, she's, you know, got a long story behind her life. Blood Raven, too, he's given everything. Like, these old mentors, like, they're not asking anyone to do what they haven't done already. And that's kind of yeah. how you get to the point when you just, like, sorry, 10-year-old boy. Like, you're the next Weirwood battery. Like, that's just what fate demands. So... Mm -hmm. I had to do it and now it's your turn and I'll show it you how to do it and make it as good for you as I can. But like, that's what you got to do. I'm not going to give you a choice. I'm just going to bring you into it, you know, like, so yeah, it's, it is supposed to be a little creepy and like everyone's getting used by purpose and destiny and, and stuff like that's how it's supposed to feel. I do think mm -hmm. George, George feels like he's an interesting mix of optimism and like kind of cynical realism. It's like the world is pretty tough. Life is pretty tough. It's full of horrible people and horrible things and bad things happen to good people. But he believes in heroism. His heroism is essentially standing up against that whenever you can, however you can. And it doesn't matter if you don't lead a whole successful revolution it's Brienne saying no chance and no choice. Like, yeah, I'm probably going to die, but I'm not going to run away. I'm going to protect these kids as long as I can. And she held out long enough for Gendry to get there and actually save the kids. So that's, and Brienne got her face eaten. So like, that's George's idea. Like the world will eat your face off. But if you fight the good fight, you go down as a hero and you might save somebody else's life who down the road will save somebody else's life, who down the road will save the world or something, you know? So like, yeah, it's a winding path that we have to follow through the shadow of darkness to find the heroism. Uh, but it's not, it's not all just some sort of, yeah, everyone's bad and everyone's turning evil and everyone's going to die. Like it's not, that's not going to be the end. Yeah. Anyway. But it's not like, I'm not trying to say like, every, I mean, yeah, a lot of the guys have their own agenda. And maybe it's not that they're all out for their own agenda, but everyone also does have their own idea of what is best. and But they're also pushing these kids towards their idea of what is best. It's That's like true. Varys with, uh, like Varys with um, 
with Fagon, like Varys says, oh, I work for the realm, but he kills Kevin Lannister because Kevin Lannister was doing too good of a job. And it's like, well, if that was true and you were really working towards the realm, then you would have allowed Kevin Lannister to do a good job. But no, you move things because you want to put your your pet project in charge. So it's manipulating things for what you believe is the best course of action, but not what the actual best course of action may be. Yeah, so I was just thinking to myself, if we had to rank all the people that think they know everything, for like who who actually has the most realistic picture of what needs to be done to save the world? Would you put Blood Raven or Marwyn first or Quave? Um, gotta be one of them three, right? Yeah, I think. To be honest, I think Marwin's the of the three of them. Marwin's seems to be the most straight hit, the straight hitter of all of them. He seems to be the one who's just like, look, I'm just going to tell you things as they are, the way they are, and you can make of that what you will. And I'd rather have someone tell me tell you cold hard truths like that. You know, I think Marwin's going to be so important as a general in this in the next two books. I really do think so. Of course, Blood Raven has access to weirwood secrets that Marwyn does not. Um, mm-hmm. Quave, we don't know the limit of her access to secret knowledge. I think those glass candles can just can do more than real time stuff. I strongly suspect we can look into the past with those as well, but we don't know that yet. That's only speculation. Um, yeah, Blood Raven. Uh, Marwyn has more current information you know, being in the Citadel than, than Blood Raven. Um, Blood Raven, like, his understanding of reality is a little different now, too, because he's so into the weirwood net or whatever. Um, and the past and future kind of all run together for him a little bit, probably. But um, going back a second, people were talking, to, you know, a common comment I see is, Hopefully Bran won't be a zombie like on the show where he doesn't have any personality or doesn't care that Mira and Jojen sacrificed for him. That was a horrible moment when Mira walked out on Bran and Bran didn't seem to care. Like that was that was yeah. awful. Um I think that we can look at Blood Raven's personality here and see that Bran won't be like he was on the show because Blood Raven here still has some personality. He's using metaphors He's speaking wistfully of his old love in a minute. Um, you know, he's kind of got this, oh, men forget, but the trees remember. Like, I mean, that's got a little attitude. You know, he's got yeah. personality here. He's not ro- He's not a robot. So, And he's old. He's been down in this cave for years and years and years, and he's still got some personality. So I don't think Bran will be... Uh, he will be different. I mean, he's going to download the weirwood net into his brain. So that's going to be crazy. But um, yeah, I don't think he'll be emotionless is the point. We shall see. There, there will be a level of detachment, um, but I just think they took it like way too far. So that was just another silly dream though. Yeah, all of them living in the rookery together, that is. Some days Bran wondered if all this wasn't just some dream. Maybe he had fallen asleep out in the snows and dreamed himself a safe, warm place. So that's... <laughs> I think that's more Azor Ahai leaving his body outside the weirwood net stuff. Like Varamir leaving his body in the snow and going into the weirwood tree. That's what this reminds me of. Like, he fell down in the snow and dreamed himself into the weirwood net. So... Also, if you've watched the uh, the backwards prologue chapter, we should start back. That's we saw that too. The reverse reading has Waymar as John going to sleep in the snow and then going into the weirwood net to lead the others into the trees. That's one theory about the end. Okay, so you have to wake, he would tell himself. You have to wake right now or you'll go dreaming into death because he's thinking he's out in the snow back at home. Once or twice he pinched his arm with his fingers really hard, but the only thing that did was make his arm hurt. In the beginning, he had tried to count the days by making note of when he woke and slept, but down here sleeping and waking had a way of melting into one another. Hey, it's kind of like my house. 
people with weird sleeping habits can relate to this. But down, um, yeah, dreams became lessons, lessons became dreams, things happened all at once or not at all. He had, had he done that or only dreamed it? Only one man in a thousand is born a skin changer, Lord Bloodraven said one day, after Bran had learned to fly. And only skin chain, one skin changer in a thousand can be a green seer. I thought the green seers were the wizards of the children, Bran said. The singers, I mean. In a sense, those you call the children of the forest have eyes as golden as the sun. But once in a while, one is born amongst them with eyes as red as blood or green as the moss on a tree in the heart of a forest. By these signs do the gods mark those who they have chosen to receive the gift. The chosen ones are not robust, and their quick years upon the earth are few, for every song must have its balance. But once inside the wood they linger long indeed. A thousand eyes, a hundred skins, wisdom deep as the roots of ancient trees. Green seers. All right, so that's one of the things that leads to the idea that that uh, it might have been Rickon that was a, event originally the one being sought after because the eyes there. So of the six direwolves, all of that Brands has golden eyes, Arya's, Sansa's, Rob's all had golden eyes. They do, but Rickon, Johns has Johns is the one with the red eyes, and Rickon's is the one with the green eyes. Yeah, Shaggy's a real hellhound. Uh, Shaggy's coloring also matches Cannibal, the dragon. Yeah. Um, and John is, and Ghost, of course, is a weirwood white with the red eyes. Um, I really think yeah. um, there's something important with the chapter where uh, Rickon sneaks down to the crypts after Ned dies. And he, the, him and Bran both have that dream. And Rickon's waiting down there with Shaggy Dog and the dogs get into the fight down there and uh mr lewin's arm gets bitten and stuff um the torch falls at brandon's legs just like rickard getting burned in front of brandon in king's landing and all just like bran stark will lose his legs rickon and shaggy are down there first of all those are hellhounds fighting so you think of simeon star eyes and that legend is some sort of archetypal hellhound fight here between summer and shaggy the, the thing is, Rickon and Shaggy are down in the crypts like a king of winter, and then they leap out of the darkness. So, like, something we're going to talk about, I think there's a lot of parallels between Blood Raven's Cave and the crypts, and I want to get into the Grey King statue stuff in a second. Um, but I do have to wonder, whatever is going to happen in the Stark crypts, like, Rickon might be involved, if he dies, his death might have something to do with working, you know, a magical thing. Like, he definitely could end up in Shaggy Dog, but... Oh, that's interesting. Skagos is a cannibal island. And yeah. Rickon went there, and his, his pup matches Cannibal the Dragon. Some people think Cannibal the Dragon went to Skagos. Maybe that's yeah, why. Yeah, I've heard that one. Anyway, um, yeah, I just wonder what Rickon... Like, we don't know what Rickon's destiny is going to be. We know Manderley's going to try to use him as a political tool. He may or may not die at some point. Um, but yeah, the, I, the fact that it's him and Shaggy down in the crypts and the fact that Shaggy is such a fearsome beast, black and green like that, like, it just feels very archetypal, stark, death wolf stuff mm -hmm. going on there, so... I don't know. Yeah. I want to keep thinking about it. Yeah. I mean, I told you in private my idea of Rickon and Davos being a Viserys the second and uh, Oaken Fist parallel. But I really like I that idea. I think that's a conversation we should save for a more Rickon involved chapter, though. Uh, I'll, okay. I could elaborate more on that for anyone in the chat who's interested. Because people are asking what we think Rickon's end role would be. Yeah, so, Tim yeah, has a theory that a doesn't chapter. involve him dying. So, <laughs> but that—that's a chapter we could we could put a pin in that for that Rick on, for one what that chapter where Rick on has a more prominent role. I've actually not read the Wolf's Den chapter. 
I've talked about it a lot of times, but I've never read it, so we might still do that. Yeah. Yep. Put a pin in it. <laughs> okay, so let's okay, uh, so there's a big clue here. So they're not robust, quick ears on the earth, but for um, once inside the wood, they linger long indeed. So what is he talking about there? That's not just joining the hive mind. Because like, once you're in the hive mind, you're not a green seer anymore. You're just part of the tree. Like you're not a wizard that can do stuff. So he's saying the wizard powers, as a trade-off, they have short physical lives. I think he's saying that, like, a lot of times the green seers, their physical bodies are weak, so they have to make it to a weirwood cave and get hooked up to the roots like Blood Raven before they die, so their lives can be extended and they can be continue to be a green seer but stuck in the cave. I think that's what he's talking about. He's saying, like, once we get hooked up to the weirwood throne, you can live a long time. And we see. Further on in the cave, we're going to see those other singers. So mm -hmm. I guess we'll come back to the Grey King idea when we get to those singers. But yeah. I, th I think what he said, like, we can see that with our human characters. The ones that have the more magical aspects to them are also usually hindered with some kind of physical abnormality. Like Blood Raven and his albinism and then losing an eye. It's because losing an eye would be could be seen as a form of disability. Uh, Jojin is our green seer, but he's you know he's kind of meek. Uh, he defers a lot to Mira. Mira is the muscle in in that in that uh, sibling relationship that's pushing him forward. So and he yeah, had his what... his gifts awakened when he got very sick near to death. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, Bran wasn't sickly. Um, born that way no he was maybe a little small but i don't know he was a kid he knocked tom in the dirt when they sparred yeah that's true well he's mostly talking about the children though here so we don't know how much this applies so brand doesn't have green or red eyes either and yet he's a green no. seer so and his, his wolf blood is raven is wolf. talking about the children when he says the green and red eyes and all this stuff. He's, he's talking about the children of the forest. So Jojen has green eyes, but he's not a green seer. You see what I mean? So like, yeah, this is how George does his magic. It's usually not sorted out neatly. Just because you have green eyes doesn't mean you're a green seer. In Jojen's case, it means he has green dreams. Um, you know, whereas uh, a child of the forest having green eyes would definitely be a green seer. So Blood Raven's red eye is ambiguous. He's an albino. So that could be why he has red eyes. Or he has red eyes because vague children of the forest blood and he's a green seer. It's 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 ambiguous. Yeah. Well that's that's kind of the joke because since Brand's wolf has the golden eyes, which I guess would be the more common feature among children of the forest, it's like if if Rickon was the one that they are actually seeking out, then it means that Blood Raven is settling for Bran when really he wanted Rickon. But Bran still would also be a better, much better option than Euron, who Blood Raven may have contacted in the past and then realized, like, oh no, wait, I gotta sever this connection. I can't let this kid get access to this power. He's he's insane. We will have to do a Euron, is Euron a Green Seer pupil stream sometime. I don't want to get lost in that. I Because I don't even, I can't even decide. I think it's a maybe, but not a confirmed. Um, interesting thing, Bran's eyes are the blue of a Tully. But it's only said once in a Game of Thrones. And George never talks about it again. I am very curious. Is that something George is going to pull out of his pocket? For when Bran is getting closer to doing some bad thing that might cause the long night. Is George going to start using those blue eyes as a symbolism of something having to do with the others? It's weird that Bran is a green seer and George gave him blue eyes instead of just like brown or something. Like he's got blue eyes. Like, are we supposed to think that's coincidence with no symbolism? But when George wants to make symbolism, he brings it up. And he never brings up Bran's eye color. 
So I just wonder if he's going to start doing that or if he just made Brand's eyes blue way back in the day because it was a Tully and it doesn't have anything to do with fucking symbolism at all. That'd be weird. <laughs> so we'll see. Um, let's see here. Oh, Brand did not understand. Go ahead. Uh, so he asked the reads. Do you like to read books, Bran? Jojen asked him. Some books. I like the fighting stories. My sister Sansa likes the kissing stories, but those are stupid. A reader lives a thousand lives before he dies, said Jojen. The man who never reads lives only one. The singers of the forest had no books. No ink, no parchment, no written language. Instead, they had the trees and the weirwoods above all. When they died, they went into the wood into leaf and limb and root, and the trees remembered. All their songs and spells, their histories and prayers, everything they knew about this world. Maesters will tell you that the weirwoods are sacred to the old gods. The singers believe they are the old gods. When singers die, they become part of that godhood. Bran's eyes widened. They're going to kill me? Mira. No, Mira said. Jojen, you're scaring him. He is not the one who needs to be afraid. Yeah, so that, that just seems to be more Jojen coming to terms with his own death there. But okay, so no written language. So, so in one way, this is a com this is a this is a commentary on uh, on f old folk tales. How leg before times of writing, legends and stories and myth were all passed down through through spoken language because there was no written language and. But, be, but when you have, like, that's why so many tales and so much history are lost. They were passed down and then they were and never written down. But when those people, when that culture or those people all die, well, all those stories, all that history dies with them. But with the trees, the trees still can serve as a sort of data bank so that you can tap into that and get that all back. Yep, I think that's right. And... Clearly, Jojen knows he's about to die. That's that's the thing we skipped right past because it's just so obvious. But yeah, um, in retrospect, it's it's real clear. Like Jojen knows he doesn't have long to live. He's not the <laughs> one who needs to be afraid. I mean, that's like he's like, dude, I, Tuesday is coming up, you know, Mira. <laughs> so um, I do think just looking at the technicalities, I think this is still compatible with my theory that the. The tree original hive mind was evicted, and I think Blood Raven will have to explain that to Bran. So here he says, um, instead they had the trees. Oh, this is Jojen talking, first of all, not Blood Raven. Um, mm -hmm. They had the trees and the weirwoods above. When they died, they went into the wood, into leaf and limb and root, and the trees remembered all their songs and spells, their histories and prayers. So they're saying, like, the trees are the memory, like I said, they're not the information. They're the thing that remembers. So it's like a memory tool or like a brain. So all I'm saying is that thing can be wiped and refreshed. So, yeah. A brain in a canister, like the whisper in the darkness. Yeah, basically. Yeah, there we go. There we go. <clears throat> so the moon was fat and full now. Summer prowled through the silent woods. A long gray shadow that grew more gaunt with every hunt. For living game could not be found. The ward upon the cave mouth still held. The dead men could not enter. Still as in... Bran's like, oh, it's still working a few weeks later. Like, bro, that's been active for 8,000 years. Um, the snows had buried most of them again, but they were still there, hidden, frozen, waiting. So that tells you a little bit. The others do kind of just chill. They are remote activated, either by the others or by the presence of humans. Um, other dead things came to join them. Things that had once been men and women, even children. Dead ravens sat on bare brown branches, wings crusted with ice. A snow bear crashed through the brush, huge and skeletal, half its head sloughed off to reveal the skull beneath. Summer and his pack fell upon it and tore it to pieces. Afterward they gorged, though the meat was rotted and half frozen, and moved even as they ate it. <laughs> That's creepy. Under the hill, they still had food to eat. A hundred kind of mushrooms grew down here. Blind white fish swam in the Black River, but they tasted just as good as fish with, with eyes once you cooked them up. 
They had cheese and milk from the goats that shared the caves with the singers. I forgot about the goats. Even some oats and barley corn and dried fruit laid by during the long summer. And almost every day they ate blood stew, thickened with barley and onions and chunks of meat. Jojen thought it must be squirrel meat, and Mira said it was rat. Bran did not care. The meat, it, it was meat, and it was good. The stewing made it tender. That's white meat, folks. Some of it might be rat, but the meat that they have available is the white meat. And they probably stew it to kill it, so it stops moving. Yeah. Well, if it is white meat, and the fact that Bran doesn't care and just thinks it's good, it is to show that Bran is getting way too comfortable with eating human flesh. I mean, yeah, he doesn't know it's human flesh. Like, he accepts when Cold Hand says, oh, it's pork. But we know it wasn't. We know there was no pork. So, yeah. It's just showing Bran is continuously breaking these taboos. But that's because no one is telling him about these taboos. And that is one thing to point out is all this time that he has spent with Bloodraven, Bloodraven has not told him the taboos that Varamir Sixkins was taught by his mentor when he was a kid. And I think there is something to that. I would compare it to the faceless men and Arya, where they're like, oh, don't do that. And then she does it. And they're like, promotion. <laughs> don't kill people extrajudiciously. Oh, good job. Let's promote. <laughs> we were going to blind you months from now, but you're ahead of schedule. So we'll do it now. Like, they're training Arya not to be a faceless man, but to be like a fucking weapon against the others because the faceless men believe that death is sacred. Mm -hmm. They would hate whiteification. And they know about whiteification because they know about everything. They knew about hard home and they keep tabs on all the news. So anyway, let's not get lost in the faceless men. But yes, it does seem like Blood Raven, like he's got a specific mess, uh, mission for Bran. He's not training him to be a normal green seer. He's training him to be the one who has to do some fucking thing. Um, yeah. You because know, Blood Raven. But again, like Blood Raven is fully aware. Like he sees that Bran is skin changing Hodor, but not once does he ever say like, eh, 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 "Nope, you're not supposed to skin change humans. That's a no no." Like. No, he's aware of it, but he allows it to happen. And so that's that's, correct. that's just what I'm saying. Like, yeah, when it when it comes to Blood Raven, why I said like Blood Raven may be working brand towards to what he thinks is is the is the greater good, but he's also doing it with that uh the means justify the ends aspect to it. Like you want to make an omelet, you gotta break some eggs. And that really which is true to Blood Raven's character. That's the way he kind of always has been, even in life. Yeah, shout out to uh, Damon Blackfire the fourth or wherever that was. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, I think that's a good point that you've made. I never thought about the fact that Blood Raven surely would know that Bran is doing that to Hodor and has not stopped him. You're totally right, though. Well, yep, that's uh, that's a good observation. So the caves were timeless, vast, silent. Shout out to Wiz the Smith. They were home to more, as the Hollow Hills essay is the caves, are, were ti the caves are timeless, Hollow Hills. Shout out Wiz the Smith. They were home to more than three score living singers. So there's 60 of them down there, guys. Also, Blood Raven earlier said female of the children of the forest. So that does imply some of them should be male. Um, we, we've always wondered, are the green men the male children? I don't think so. I think they're different races with male and female, each one. But I'm not sure about that. So They were home to more, okay, three score living singers and the bones of thousands dead and extended far below the hollow hill. Men should not go wandering in this place, Leaf warned them. The river you hear is swift and black and flows down and down to a sunless sea. And there are passages that go even deeper. Bottomless pits and sudden shafts, forgotten ways that lead to the very center of the earth. Even my people have not explored them all, and we have lived here for a thousand thousand of your man years, which is a million, by the way. So, Sunless Sea, I mean, that's, um, that's Coleridge. That's a reference to a poem. Uh, but 
yeah, we don't know how far they go down or if that river might actually go, you know, under the wall and back somewhere. We talked about that theory, that Mira will make a boat and sail them out of the cave. Because um, that sinkhole is three miles further north, too. It's in the wrong direction. So it's not the way we want to go out. Anyway, maybe John and Danny will be there to pick them up by the time they escape. Who knows? I don't think so. But yeah, go ahead and pick up the reading here, unless you have thoughts. Uh, Though the men of the Seven Kingdoms might call them the children of the forest, Leif and her people were far from childlike. Little wise men of the forest would have been closer. They were small compared to men, as a wolf is smaller than a dire wolf. That does not mean it is a pup. They had nut-brown skin, dappled like a deer's with paler spots, and large ears that could hear things that no man could hear. Their eyes were big, too. Great golden cat's eyes that could see down passages where a boy's eyes saw only blackness. Their hands had only three fingers and a thumb, with sharp black claws instead of nails. And they did sing. They sang in the true tongue, so Bran could not understand the words, but their voices were pure as winter air. Where are the rest of you? Bran asked Leaf once. Gone, Gone down, down to the, into earth. the earth, she answered. Into the stones, into the trees. Before the first men came, all this land you call Westeros was home to us. Yet even in those days we were few. The gods gave us long lives, but not great numbers. Lest we overrun the world as deer will overrun a wood, where there are no wolves to hunt them. That was in the dawn of days, when our sun was rising. Now it sinks, and this is our long dwindling. The giants are almost gone as well. They who were our bane and brothers... The great lions of the western hills have been slain. The unicorns are all but gone. The mammoths down to a few hundred. The dire wolves will outlast us all, but their time will come as well. In the world that man ha that men have made, there was no room for them or us. So, um, I was wondering, Tim, as I was doing research on the pact, I was mm -hmm. trying to find hard evidence that the first men actually did war on the children of the forest. I was just poking the idea, like, is this one of those things that people just say and say and say, and there's actually no evidence for? Because when it comes down to the Andal invasion, we find the first men fighting with the children against the Andals and dying alongside the children. There's the Weirwood Alliance in the Stormlands. There's the High Heart. We know all the First Men castles are built around Weirwoods. The ancient First Men all worshipped the Weirwoods and worked with the children. The children helped set up the Night's Watch. There is a ton of partnership between the First Men and the Children of the Forest. And I was just trying to find actual evidence that they warred on the children. Leaf doesn't really say it here. She's just implying that, like, Men is expanding the world. Men, they're making a different world where there's no room for us. They didn't mm -hmm. say like she's not saying. Oh, they killed us and thousands, and they hunted us. And there's none of that here, is there? No, no. So what we can think is is that there probably may have been just like how the children sometimes war. They they admit themselves like sometimes they fought with the giants, but most often they lived at peace. Like, yeah, maybe when the first men came, there was some initial conflict. Like, first contacts don't always go well. And right. humans and humans are quick to kill things they don't understand. So, initially chopping down weirwood trees, thinking that the faces carved were spying on them. But, when they are able to have, like, their sit-down, and the fact that the first men are so quick to adopt the gods of the children, except, like, the, the weirwoods as things kind of seems like okay uh, like maybe yeah there was like there was a uh, a bad first contact maybe a fight here or there but eventually they settled down and talked and ha really like hammered it out hashed it out and came to more of an agreement because of the first men adopting their religion and their culture and then it really seems like the andals were the ones that really screwed it all up because of them and their and them looking at it through their religious aspect of no, this is you know monsters, demons. You get branded of the bloody blade of uh, the uh, the killing of children, how it becomes Red Lake and stuff like that. Okay. And that's that's like 
Yeah, that's like it's like think of like Christianity just kind of like snuffing out pagan gods. Like that's kind of a way to look at it. Yeah, I do. I I'm I'm only questioning it. I'm not saying I think it didn't. It's a myth. So yeah, Brandon of the Bloody Blade is said to war against the children, and so is the first Durin, God's grief. But it's weird because Durin also it's said that the children helped him build Storm's End. And then it said that his son gave the rainwood back to the children. So obviously there's multiple Durns and we don't know which is one, but there's there's a it's implied that like there's a little bit of both. Um yeah. what I do know, and I'm gonna talk about this in the packed video, is like everything after the long night, there's partnership everywhere. And all the old yeah. first men castles in the south are built around weirwoods. So like it's really is the Andals who cut most of them down, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. I think I think the relationship with the children and the first men was more like the children and the giants. Occasionally there were fights, but probably more peace. But then the Andals came and ruined everything. <laughs> like well, no, the of course, Christianity didn't them. snuff out. They didn't successfully. They, Christianity they did tried. snuff out a few things. Like there are many branches yeah. of different religions, like Catholic, oh, yeah, for example. Fight. Um, that had were yeah. snuffed out, but of course, yeah, paganism still exists. Doesn't mean they didn't try. No, they, they just, exactly. Doesn't mean they didn't try. That's what, of course, what you meant. Anyway, um, doesn't mean they didn't kill a lot of people. All right, okay, moving yeah. along. Uh, so yeah, and notice the list of magical animals, right? Lions, unicorns, yeah. mammoths, dire wolves. Well, that and you could just as easily like list so many species just in our own lifetime of how how many species have gone extinct just within the past few years like that's the commentary right there she seemed sad when she said it and that made brand sad as well it was only later that he thought men would not be sad men would be wroth men would hate and swear bloody vengeance the singers sing sad songs where men would fight and kill so that's Brand's observation. That's interesting. I remembered that as being the words of Leaf, but that's actually Brand's observation. One day, Mira and Jojen decided to go see the river, despite Leaf's cautions. I want to come too, Brand said. Mira gave him a mournful look. The river was 600 feet below, down steep slopes and twisty passages, she explained, and the last part required climbing down a rope. Hodor could never make the climb with you on his back. I'm sorry, Bran. Bran remembered a time when... So, okay. This sounds like a lot of specifics George is giving us here. So, 600 feet below. It's a long way down. Steep slopes, twisty passages. But it's only the last part that Hodor couldn't make. The last part required climbing down a rope. So, if Hodor did try to carry Bran down those passages, he could potentially make it as far as that. Mira could probably put Bran on her back and climb down the rope the rest of the way. But Hodor would be stuck holding a door if there is a door there. Um, maybe there's another way for Hodor to get down. I don't know. But that's what we're told about the river. So I just wanted to point that out. And of course, Bran remembers a time when no one could climb as good as him, not even Robert John. Part of him wanted to shout at them for leaving him and another part wanted to cry. He was almost a man grown, though, so he said nothing. But after they were gone, he slipped inside Hodor's skin and followed them. The big stable boy no longer fought him as he had the first time, back in the lake tower during the storm. Like a dog who had all the fight whipped out of him, Hodor would curl up and hide whenever Bran reached out for him. That's a hard sentence to read, isn't it? Mm -hmm. His hiding yeah, place was... Go ahead. I was just going to say, like, Bran does recognize, like, yeah, this is a little messed up, but he still keeps doing it. Um, let's see, yeah. His hiding place was somewhere deep within him, a pit where not even Bran could touch him. Hodor is hiding in a pit. Is that talking about climbing down to that river? Interesting. No one wants to hurt you, Hodor, he said silently to the child man whose flesh he'd taken. I just want to be strong again for a while. I'll give it back the way I always do. Go ahead. No one ever knew when he was wearing Hodor's skin. Bran only had to smile, do as he was told, and mutter, Hodor, from time to time. 
and he could follow Mira and Jojen, grinning happily, without anyone suspecting it was really him. He often tagged along, whether he was wanted or not. In the end, the Reeds were glad he came. Jojen made it down the rope easily enough, but after Mira caught a blind white fish with her frog spear, it was time to climb back up. His arms began to tremble, and he could not make it to the top, so they had to tie the rope around him and let Hodor haul him up. Hodor, he grunted every time he gave a pull. Hodor, Hodor, Hodor. Okay, so Hodor can make it down to the rope part, and Hodor is strong enough to lower people down or pull them up from that ledge. So, Mm -hmm. potentially there could be a hold the door situation here, where he makes a stand here, and, because it doesn't have to be a fucking door, you know, necessarily. I mean, there kind of should be, but there doesn't have to be. It could just be holding yeah. the breach, you know. Mm-hmm. But no, they, it's got to be because they're going to tell him, hold the door. There's got to be a, at least a doorway or something. Hmm. Hmm. Something yeah. we'll just have to wait and see how, how George does it. I mean, I'm the idea of like whatever magical seal is keeping whites out, like the way the show did it with the whites getting in and chasing them and them being forced into a situation like like that where they get to the point where it's like, okay, only so many of us can make it down the rope. Like, Hodor is just going to have to stay back. But, yeah, I'm not sure where the door comes in in that point. There could be another black gate that's, just, you know, somewhere down there as well. But we'll see. Yeah, Preston's theory is all about the sinkhole. Um, I'm more zeroed in on this river down here. Because, like I said, the sinkhole is three miles north, so that's kind of going the wrong direction. But, And I hate that. I cut across. Like, I hate going in the wrong direction if I'm walking or driving. It kills me. Anyway, I have to really make myself like, no, this way is faster, even though it's geographically kind of out of the way. It says it's faster. I have to really talk myself off the ledge. Speaking of ledges, the moon was a crescent, thin and sharp as the blade of a knife. Oh, you were reading. Go ahead. So I just read a whole bunch. Go ahead. Uh, Summer dug up a severed arm, black and covered with hoarfrost, its fingers opening and closing as it pulled itself across the frozen snow. <laughs> it's, it's like a thing from the Adams family. Very much there so. was still enough, there was still enough meat on it to fill his empty bo- his fill his empty belly, and after that was done, he cracked the arm bones for the marrow. Only then did the arm remember it was dead. The bones remember. Oh yeah, I'm dead. Bran ate with Summer and his pack as a wolf. As a raven, he flew with the murder, circling the hill at sunset, watching for foes, feeling the icy touch of the air. As Hodor, he explored the caves. He found chambers full of bones, shafts that plunged deep into the earth, a place where the skeletons of gigantic bats hung upside down from the ceiling. He even crossed the slender stone bridge that arched over the abyss and discovered more passages and chambers on the far side. One was full of singers, and thrown like Brynden in nests of weirwood roots that wove under and through and around their bodies. Most of them looked dead to him, but as he crossed in front of them, their eyes would open and follow the light of his torch. And one of them had opened and closed a wrinkled mouth, as if he were trying to speak. Hodor, Bran said to him, and he felt the real Hodor stir down in his pit. Okay, and then the next chapter, or the next paragraph I want to read because of what I want to say. Seated on his throne of roots in the great cavern, half corpse and half tree, Lord Brynden seemed less a man than some ghastly statue made of twisted wood, old bone, and rotted wool. The only thing that looked alive in the pale ruin that was his face was his one red eye, burning like the last coal in a dead fire, surrounded by twisted roots and tatters of leathery white skin hanging off a yellowed skull. Okay, so... Um, and then a minute later, he calls him a grizzly talking corpse. I guess I'll read that too. The sight of him still frightened Bran. The weirwood roots snaking in and out of his withered flesh. The mushrooms sprouting from his cheeks. The white wooden worm that grew from the socket where one eye had been. He liked it better when the torches were put out. In the dark, he could pretend it was the three-eyed crow who whispered to him, and not some grizzly talking corpse. So, one day I will be like him, the thought filled Bran with dread. So, so um, okay. These singers are one of the biggest mysteries. Um, 
There's a bunch of them. How many are there? What, what did it say? Just one was full of singers and thrown like Brendan. In nests of weird roots that wove on. Okay, so these are children of the forest, green seers, who are retired. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It sounds Basically. very, it sounds a lot like the crypts. Any crypts, really, because they're just kind of on thrones in a row. But specifically, it's the Winterfell crypts, which have rows of thrones. Okay. Yeah. Here they are, weirwood thrones. And these singers seem to be more far gone than Blood Raven, but they are not dead because their eyes are still moving. And yeah. one of them sort of almost tries to talk. That one might be the most recent. And just as Blood Raven can speak, but with great effort and not for that long, this guy might be a hundred years older, this child of the forest, something like that. They could almost speak like, so yes, if over 420 watching, of course, press like, if you're watching the gray King, let's talk about the gray King. So the gray King, by the way, there's new gray King artwork in the calendar. Tim, have you seen it? There's him next to a mermaid. Yeah, yeah, that's like some <laughs> Nimble Dick wants to cosplay that scene. Oh, yes, Nimble Dick <laughs> likes it. Nimble Dick likey likey. That is for sure. I'm Squisher Maidens. Oh, finally got a, a beautiful Squisher Maiden and share a sea star who's symbolic Squisher Maiden. So we, it's a good calendar. We, we might have to get our hands on that there calendar. All right, now, so um, let me just uh, <clears throat> get the Nimble out. So... So, <laughs> the Grey King, folks. The Grey King is implied as a green seer because we know that Naga's ribs are weirwood. And that implies that his throne of Naga's bones and his crown of Naga's fangs were weirwood also. Galen Whitestaff had a staff that was either weirwood or Naga's bones. But again, Naga's bones are weirwood. So, ancient Ironborn. Their priest has a weirwood staff, and their first king is sits on a weirwood throne with weirwood wrapped around his head. That makes him sound like a green seer. It also says he lives for a thousand years and seven, and his skin turned gray, and that's why he looks call, is called the Gray King. So, if you see him as a green seer, it's easy to understand the thousand year lifespan and turning gray as him sitting in that weirwood throne and slowly merging with it. Like Blood Raven is like pale white flesh, you know, like that's pretty close to gray. He's called a statue and a talking corpse. Statues are gray. We now here's the key thing. Weirwood petrifies and turns to stone over time. And even these weirwood thrones are half dead weirwood. They're weaving dead branches into the roots to make these thrones. So half of these thrones are already on their way to petrifying. So here's the theory. Oh, last part of it. The Blackgate weirwood face looks like the Grey King in the sense that Bran looks at it and says, it's dead. It looks dead. Then he says, no, it looks as if somebody who could live for a thousand years and grow older but never die. And that's what happens to the Grey King. He, and even a thousand years and seven, a thousand eyes and one, even the cadence and the language of it is meant to evoke Blood Raven. So Grey King living for a thousand years and turning gray is almost certainly the long version of this process where someone sits on a weirwood throne and eventually, this is the theory part, it ends with petrification. Those dead weirwood branches are going to turn to stone The corpse itself, if it's not completely absorbed, perhaps it turns to stone as well. And so I believe that in the lowest levels of the Winterfell crypts, which should be 8,000 years old, the stone thrones in the lowest levels will be petrified weirwood thrones, and there will be dead singers on them. Those will be the original Kings of Winter. They may also be the original Night's Watch. Okay, they may be the same thing. Who knows? But I do think those original Kings of Winter could still have some level of psychic awareness or activity. Now, Tim. Mm-hmm. We're, so first of all, shout out to Eldrick Stoneskin, a new Song of Ice and Fire YouTuber. He's got a channel 
based around a theory that he has about the Winterfell uh, kings actually waking up, um, which I tentatively disagree with. Um, I haven't watched all his videos. I I like the videos. I think they're good. I want to finish watching the series before I give too much of an opinion. I tend to think it's symbolism, but um, a lot of people have been checking out his videos. Uh, seems like a nice fellow, so shout out to Eldrick Stoneskin. Um, but short of the idea that those statues are going to get up, I think the symbolism that describes them as watching everything that's going on could imply that there is some awareness left of some of these kings of winter. And that would be the lowest levels that are blocked off where we might have ancient green seers who petrified and turned to stone. Um, then we've also got the grayscale idea, which is floating out in left field. Tim, make it make sense. You've got a great find on one of George's influences about people turning to stone and shit. Do you not? Yeah. So, yeah. So, so the first thing I want to point out, cause this is, of course it's me. So we're going to Lovecraft, um, which is here, these children that are, like you said, retired. They're not dead yet. I'm not dead yet. I'm happy. But they are in the process of becoming one with the trees. I'm so they're I, in more. I just picked. I just picture one of them <laughs> saying, "I think I'll go for a walk." <laughs> Sorry, but, go uh, ahead. Go ahead. I will so interrupt you. Rather, so rather, it seems like they're in. They're sort of in a form of cryostasis almost. And but the singers are also dreamers. But this is another uh, Lovecraftian thing, which is the idea of being dead but dreaming. And we talked about. The children of the forest, despite being referred to as squirrel people, they have all this reptilian aspect to them, which gives a lot of squisher traits. So that is becomes down to Cthulhu, which is Cthulhu waits in his sunken city of Rila, of Ryla, dead but dreaming. So that's here. That's the influence here. Uh, de dead but dreaming. That's what. That's how I view these children that are becoming one with the trees. And then as for the stone statues, like, yeah, I've heard that idea before, the idea of the stone statues coming up, because there's also that terracotta warrior aspect to the stone statues being down there. But anyway, if the thrones that the statues sit on are petrified weirwoods, and we've always, we've heard over and over and over, the trees remember, well, if, if weirwood trees turn to stone, then that would mean the stones remember. And those statues are sitting on those stones that remember, which is why they might have those following eyes. It might be the influence of the weirwood throne that they're sitting on, then using like the uh, the statue built on top of it becomes a conduit to that too. Because who's to say that those statues are carved of stone and also not petrified weirwood themselves? Like the whole the whole statue might be petrified weirwood. Okay, but so as for what you're hold on, so real quick. Um... You you almost said it, but you didn't, so I'll just have to say it. This could be the deepest level of the North Remembers idea. Like, yeah. what does the North remember? Well, secrets about the long night, obviously. But, yeah, the bones remember, the trees remember. The trees are bone white, and it all they all mm. petrify and turn to stone. So, yeah, the, it is. it does seem like there should be some awareness down in the crypts among the stone kings. I think that at some point, Tim, they did begin just carving regular stone thrones like Brandon and Ned. They're not sitting on petrified weirwood. Um, but on the lowest levels, I think it could be that, but go ahead with the, uh, with the correlation. Well, so one thing I did to, uh, point out to you is when it comes to grayscale, uh, grayscale is actually another Lovecraft thing because it's taken from, the star spawn. Uh, these are Cthulhu's children. Uh, he has three sons, and his eldest son, Gatnathwa, has the ability to turn people into stone, but he keeps their brains alive. So they feel everything. They feel as their bodies turn to stone until finally they're driven to madness and they're just like stuck inside the stone body, completely aware of what's going on around them, but feeling only pain. And that sounds like exactly like what grayscale does to people. So the idea of stone men and the shrouded lord being a lord of stone men is like the idea of Gatnathwa and uh, and his stone uh, his stone cursed victims. 
So essentially what you're saying is that there is a story about people turning to stone in such a way mm -hmm. that their mind is still alive and experiences the very last Grace. parts of them turning to stone. And that is exactly yeah. how grayscale goes. Exactly. Yeah. They, uh, throughout the entire process, as their bodies turn to stone, they can still see and still hear until they're met, until it gets to the point where even their eyes and their ears are forced closed, but they still feel they're still fully aware of everything that's going around them, even as they turn to complete stone. So, yes. And so again, with the Eldrick stone skin thing, um, he's po basically, if he's right, then he's right. And those things are going to, they're going to get up and it's a more literal version of the symbolism. But even if his conclusion isn't right, his train of thought is very good. And all the symbols that he's pointing out are definitely like very cohesively point out. And it's got a lot in common with green zombies theory. If you watch it, um, yeah. But certainly there's a lot to, again, imply that there is a sleeping awareness inside some of these kings. And that's the Chekhov's gun. It's got to have some payoff. We got to have some, maybe it's just John and Bran and other Starks having communication with them. Because getting back to the Grey King theory, which is that literally the Grey King is talking about the finish of the process. Like if Blood Raven eventually will turn into a statue, right? And he's compared to a statue right here. That's part of the thing. Um, it's like, what would be the whole point when Blood Raven says, oh, they linger long indeed. It just implies that they're still psychically active. Like even after Blood Raven can't talk anymore, he can still do stuff probably. So it's like the Grey King may have been someone that got people on the outside to do his bidding for like a thousand years. So he's a kind of God emperor, essentially, instead of turning into a worm, he's turning into a statue. But if you're a psychic wizard, you could still get people to do your bidding and reign as king, even though you're a statue. And so I literally think that's what happened with Grey King, potentially. Um, yeah, because that is, and that's essentially what the story out of the Aeons, the Lovecraft story where this got Nothwa thing comes from, uh, it does end with the stone with the stone mummy that this is all correlating from at the very end, opening its eyes. So, you know, yeah. So the stone man does eventually move. He does is, move. Is he's just open his eyes, and that's it. Uh, like he's opening his eyes, but it's the it's the fact that like uh, it's it it it, it uh, when he opens its eyes, it unleashes the curse again. Like this curse had been dormant, and now. By by this mummy by this mummy awakening, it's come it's come back. Okay, see that makes sense to me, um, because those kings are like locked up. The swords are imprisoning the kings. It implies mm -hmm. so there should be like them waking up should be a terrible thing. So I think yes, yeah, it should activate yeah. a curse or something like that. That makes sense. Yeah, and because grayscale, for George's part, grayscale is a curse. It's Gar Garen's curse which comes after a reptile war <laughs> because of the tur the turtle wars. Right. Right. <laughs> right. <clears throat> so, so yeah, there you go. So that's squished. basically the theory is that that's what the gray King story is referring to is the end of that process. And that mm -hmm. the important part of this is the Kings of winter. That is why Theon in the chapter we read last week, Tim, when he looks at his gray skin, which makes him a Grey King parallel, he thinks a Stark at last. And it's like, oh, that's confusing. He's turning into the Grey King, the hero of his people, but he's thinking about the Starks and he's the Prince of Winterfell. What does that tell mm -hmm. you? Like, ah, uh, the, the, the original Princes of Winterfell were Grey Kings. And they are Grey Kings now. They're Grey Stone Kings, but they were originally kings like the Grey King, which means we're with thrones. So you see how this all works. And again, that also makes sense of the Black Gate face looking like the Grey King or matching that description of a thousand-year-old person who didn't quite die but just kept getting older. It's just George trying to get us to think of the Grey King as a weirwood face that's underground. Something like that. Yeah. Oh, and then Scotty Bay brought up the Grey Starks, which were a branch family of the Starks. 
Yep. Yep. Oh, there's the Argos stone skin legend too. Yeah, he's. That's a little different reference. That's Argos um, of the many eyes. It's a Greek myth. But all right, so let's go here. Um, Hodor down in his pit. And then we read all the description of Blood Raven. One day I will be like him. Go ahead and pick it up there. Uh, one day I will be like him. The thought filled Bran with dread. Bad enough that he was broken with his useless legs. Was he doomed to lose the rest too? To spend all his years with a weirwood growing in him and through him? Lord Brynden drew his life from the tree, Leaf told them. He did not eat. He did not drink. He slept. He dreamt. He watched. I was going to be a knight, Bran remembered. I used to run and climb and fight. It seemed a thousand years ago. What was he now? Only Bran the Broken Boy, Brandon of House Stark, Prince of a Lost Kingdom, Lord of a Burned Castle, heir to ruins. He had thought the Three-Eyed Crow would be a sorcerer, a wise old wizard who could fix his legs, but that was some stupid child's dream, he realized now. I am too old for such fancies, he told himself. A thousand eyes, a hundred skins, wisdom deep as the roots of ancient trees. That was good as being a knight. Almost as good, anyway. <laughs> it's kind of funny, Brand telling himself to grow up. I'm too old for that. Like, well, you're not, but you're going to have to be yeah. like you are now. <laughs> um, <laughs> real quickly, uh, shout out to Skylar and Eli. A couple of PayPals that came in a minute ago. No questions, just PayPals. Okay, keep going. Oh, almost as good. I'll pick it up. You're drinking. The moon was a black hole in the sky. Again, outside the cave, the world went on. Outside the cave, the sun rose and set. The moon turned. The cold winds howled. Under the hill, Trojan Reed grew ever more sullen and solitary to his sister's distress. She would often sit with Bran beside their little fire, talking of everything and nothing, petting Summer where he slept between them, whilst her brother wandered the caverns by himself. Jojen had even taken to climbing up to the cave's mouth when the day was bright. He would stand there for hours looking out over the forest, wrapped in furs yet shivering all the time. He wants to go home, Mira told Bran. He will not even try and fight his fate. He says the green dreams do not lie. He's being brave, said Bran. The only time a man can be brave is when he is afraid, his father had told him once, long ago on the day they found the direwolf pups in the summer snows. He still remembered. He's being stupid, Mira said. I'd hoped that when we found you, your three-eyed crow, now I wonder why we ever came. For me, Bran thought. His green dreams, he said. His green dreams. His green Mira. dreams. Mira's oh, voice yeah, was, was bitter. Hodor, said Hodor. <laughs> Mira began to cry. Go ahead. Uh, Bran, Bran hated being crippled then. Don't cry, he said. He wanted to put his arms around her, hold her tight the way his mother used to hold him back at Winterfell when he'd hurt himself. She was right there, only a few feet from him, but so far out of reach it might have been a hundred leagues. To touch her, he would need to pull himself along the ground with his hands, dragging his legs behind him. The floor was rough and uneven, and it would be slow going, full of scrapes and bumps. I could put on Hodor's skin, he thought. Hodor could hold her and pat her on the back. The thought made Bran feel strange, but he was still thinking it when Mira bolted from the fire, back out into the darkness of the tunnels. He heard her steps recede until there was nothing but the voices of the singers. The moon was a crescent, thin and sharp as the blade of a knife. The days marched past one after another, one after the other, each shorter than the one before. The nights grew longer. No sunlight ever reached the caves beneath the hill. No moonlight ever touched those stony halls. Ah, so that again sounds like Winterfell Crypt, stony halls. Or the Grey King's stony hall. Even the, oh, you know what? I forgot. When Bran is in a coma, his rib cage uh, gets the Naga's ribs parallel. I forget what the language is, but... His the rise and fall of his rib cage because he's like really thin, you know, um, is com is basically compared to Naga's ribs. 
So, yeah, it's just like, yeah, the whole thing is a metaphor. <laughs> so what's the Grey King's Hall? It's like, yeah, it's that body that's a prison that enables you to fly. That's why it's this, his hall is a weirwood boat, because that's how you sail the Green Sea. It's a vehicle for travel. That's what the tree is. And the tree becomes the body of the green seer, but it's that body that flies. So, yeah. Anyway. Anyway. Uh, no moonlight ever touched the stony halls, right? Okay. So, even, and remember, Winterfell is also described as a stone tree. That's another great, I mean, Eldric Stoneskin is talking about that a lot, but of course, we are familiar with that from the brand. Uh, episode of the Weirwood Compendium, going back years and years and years. We talk, made a whole big deal about how he climbs the tower of the stone tree, which just foreshadows him, you know, being a green seer and climbing a Weirwood tree. So, yeah, the, the, the Winterfell crypts are specified as the root zone of the stone tree. And that's where the green seers live. So even the stars were strangers there. Those things belonged to the world above, where time ran its iron circles, day to night to day to night. It is time, Lord Brendan said. Something in his voice so sent icy fingers running up. Oh, sorry, that is you. Time for what? For the next step. For you to go beyond skin changing and give in to your hate, young Skywalker. Oh, sorry. Yeah, you're right. It slides right in. It does. It does. <laughs> For you to go beyond skin changing and learn what it means to be a green seer. The trees will teach him, said Leaf. She beckoned. And that was, that's a good call, Tim. That is good. And another of the singers patted forward, the white-haired one that Mira had named Snowy Locks. So there you go, white hair. She had a weirwood bowl in her hands, carved with a dozen faces, like the one the heart trees wore. Inside was a white paste, thick and heavy, with dark red veins running through it. You must eat of this, said Leaf. She handed Bran a wooden spoon. Let me get the Snowy Locks art. I've not been sharing a bunch yeah. of art. Uh, you guys have seen all the Bran and Children of the Forest art a lot lately. I've been using it, but yeah. we, we do have to get this Snowy Locks out. Yeah. It does, because, like, I just want to Yep. Before we go on, I just want to point out, like, the fact that Palpatine lines fit so easily <laughs> into what Blood Raven's saying, God, it just shows how big of a nerd George is, but I love it. <laughs> He's so definitely real quick, I'm going to close this so that I can make this bigger. There, this is Snowy Locks by Sick Delusion. It's a very good Child of the Forest. You got the, the doe spots. We got the uh, the black claws. We avoided portraying sexual anatomy because that's not spelled out. That's a good choice by the artist. And we see a very like fawn-like face, which is what I have to think George is going for. But those eyes do look reptilian. You can see it. Mm -hmm. Cat's eyes, snake's eyes, pretty much the same. Uh, the same. The same. And there is that disgusting-looking bowl of weirwood paste. So, oh, the cover art, thank you. Um, that is, let me pull that up. That's The cover art is called, why does that keep coming up? Damn it. It's called Eye of Raven. And it is by Art Germ. I believe they're on, uh, you know, DeviantArt and stuff. Art Germ. So that's Eye of Raven. And I'll just pull that up. Here's the whole thing. I'm going to go back to the snowy locks in just a second. But that is that is the, the cover art. So there's Raven. Raven Bran. He's about to open his third eye, so that's appropriate. Here is snowy locks. And the thing about this bowl of, of paste, as you guys know, there is, a, there is a hidden truth here. And that hidden truth... Is this. <laughs> it's that. That's what's yep. going on. Um, here's another angle. This is, um. oh, shoot. I opened the wrong thing. No, that's Photoshop. Well, I have it open. So, yeah. The joke is they've been making uh, frog stew 
in the Cranogman helmet all the way up here. But like Cranogman heads go in Cranogman helmets. And Cranogman are called frog people. So frog stew inside a Cranog helmet is really just talking about making stew out of Jojen's brains. Which is what this is depicting. So, yeah, uh, if you want to find out the truth about all this, the video you want is We Would Paste as People. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure Car Snark will drop the link for that. But yep. yes. Facts. Soylent Green Sears. Soylent Green Sears. Yep. Soylent That's green hashtag green. facts. So let me. Uh, can you go ahead and pick up the reading while I reassemble the screen? Uh, the All boy right. looked at the bowl uncertainly. What is it? A paste of weirwood a seeds. Something about the look of. <laughs> She Something said, chuckling to herself, <laughs> cupping her hand, like. <laughs> These things don't grow seeds. <laughs> I know, we've never so, seen a seed. Ever. We've never seen We've a been seed. in the God's Wood, there's leaves all over the floor. No seeds. Yeah. The, no the, seeds. When they talk about trying to grow weirwoods in the veil and how they won't take root, what they talk about is transporting an already grown weirwood to the veil, not trying to grow one from a seedling. That's right. <laughs> And when Garth the Green planted weirwoods, like we're supposed to connect that to the legends of Garth the Green demanding blood sacrifice. Like that's how you plant weirwoods. If there is even such a thing. Like it's more like we're talking about giving trees faces, probably. I don't think anybody plants weirwoods. I think they just grow. But maybe you can create a weirwood organism. I don't think so, Tim. I just think they already exist. But no, I I I think they I think they uh, procreate the way mushrooms do, that it's spores. Weirwood spores. <laughs> Which obviously came on the meteors, yes. Um, yeah. We're back to Long that again. Got <laughs> I got to make a video about the mushroom symbolism. It's so fun. All right. Um, something about so the look of it. Go ahead. Something about the look of it made Bran feel ill. The red veins were only weirwood sap, he supposed. But in the torchlight, they looked m remarkably like blood. He dipped the spoon into the paste, then hesitated. Will this make me a green seer? Your blood make oh, your blood makes you a green seer," said Lord Brendan. "This will help awaken your gifts and wed you to the trees." I don't want to marry a tree. <laughs> but who else would wed a broken boy like him? A thousand eyes, a hundred skins. Wisdom deep as the roots of ancient trees. A green seer. He ate. Nom, 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 nom. It had a bitter taste, though not so bitter as acorn paste. The first spoonful was the hardest to get down. He almost retched it right back up. The second tasted better. The third was almost sweet. All right, so we take this, right, and we juxtapose this against shade of the evening and how the first taste of shade of the evening is like rotten meat but then the second taste is a little bit better and the third taste and all so on and so forth so the rest the <laughs> lunk the lunk in the chat in quotes he ate george r, r. martin 2011 <laughs> uh, such so as it the is rest... <laughs> The rest he spooned up eagerly. Why had he thought that it was bitter? It tasted of honey, of new fallen snow, of pepper and cinnamon, and the last kiss his mother ever gave him. The empty bowl slipped from his fingers and clattered on the cavern floor. I don't feel any different. What happens next? Who's hungry for cereal, by the way? All that just <laughs> empty bowl clattering? Like, I could just hear that cereal bowl sound. Anyway, Leaf touched his hand. The trees will teach you. The trees remember. So this is the closest thing to disproving my whole theory about the weirwood net being exiled as the others or whatever. It's like, I'm saying that there's the trees are just an empty hard drive that's been filled with green seers. Um, but here Leaf is like, the trees will teach you. And that sounds like there is some tree intelligence. Um, but it could just be that using the trees sort of shows you the way. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, there's also the split idea where it's like, not that the entire hive mind was expelled, 
but that like a part of it was there was some sort of schism drawn so <laughs> there could be some trees left in the trees like uh, hodor so down just... in the pit that's what it would be it'd be like hodor down in his pit cowering yeah. and that's probably why all this is juxtaposed like brand taking over hodor hodor it has tree symbolism Bran riding around in the wicker basket on Hodor's back is foreshadowing of Bran riding the weirwood tree. That's why they call Hodor a horse and all this stuff. So, yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying is that like when Azor High took over the weirwood net, it left something hiding down in the pit. That's the trees. That's what's left. And some of it got definitely exiled and became the others. But yeah. That's the that's the parallel. So the trees will teach you. The trees remember. He raised a hand, and the other singers began to move about the cavern, extinguishing the torches one by one. The darkness thickened and crept toward them. Close your eyes, said the three-eyed crow. Slip your skin, as you do when you join with summer. But this time, go into the roots instead. Follow them up through the earth, to the trees upon the hill. And tell me what you see. Bran closed his eyes and slipped free of his skin. Into the roots, he thought. Into the weirwood. Become the tree. For an instant, he could see the cavern and its black mantle. Could hear the river rushing by below. Then all at once, he was back home again. Lord Eddard Stark sat upon a rock beside the deep black pool in the God's Wood the pale roots of the heart tree twisting around him like an old man's gnarled arms. The great sword ice lay across Lord Eddard's lap, and he was cleaning the blade with an oil cloth. Winterfell, Bran whispered. His father looked up. Who's there? he asked, turning. And Bran, frightened, pulled away. His father and the black pool and the gods would faded and were gone, and he was back in the cavern, the pale, thick roots of his weirwood throne cradling his limbs as a mother does a child. A torch flared to lie before him. Okay, so a couple of things here. And shout out to Minty in the chat. Hello, Minty. Um, so we've got... Well, the yeah, there's just so much. This chapter is ridiculous. Um, he, Blood Raven tells Bran to look out the trees on the top of the hill not Winterfell's heart tree. And for some reason, Bran pops into the Winterfell tree instead. I don't think that's disobedient. I think maybe that's like Bran being really strong. Like that was, that's like a step two or step three trick to go to a different tree. Um, but I just, I never noticed that. Bran is like, oh, just look out the trees literally on the top of the hill. Like go into the roots and then go mm -hmm. up those roots to that tree. But he just jumps right to Winterfell. So, interesting. And then, of course, there's this parallel. We see Eddard with the pale roots of the heart tree twisting around him like an old man's gnarled arms. And the very two paragraphs later, it's Bran, the pale, thick roots of his weirwood throne cradling his limbs as a mother does a child. So, together, it's like the entire Stark family line is cradled by the weirwoods. That's I, I read this in a very thematic sense. Like Ned wasn't even a green seer or a skin changer that we know of that that was activated, but we can see, nevertheless, in the dream, the heart tree is like an old man protecting Eddard, and then we go back to the weirwood cave, and here's the weirwood like a mother cradling Bran, and. It's mixed. like earlier we had all this darkness language that's very creepy and making us very unsettled. But here George is giving us a different note. And here we can see the Starks, not only are they the custodians of the Weirwoods, but the Weirwoods are the custodians of them as well. And they are looking out for the Starks. So it's a very interesting parallel there. What, what do you make of it, Tim? So my thought was, since we don't know the the mechanics of green seers traveling through the trees, is that maybe just how he think he his thought is into the roots and then he's in the roots. So maybe Winterfell is just his first thought, and that's why he's there. And that's something you could expect from Bran. Bran would probably think of something he would recognize first, and home 
is a comfort. So home is is would be the probably the first thing he thinks of, especially if he's having to think of a place that has a weirwood. Home would be the the initial one, and that might be why he's there. So maybe the way seeing through a green seeing through a tree works is maybe you have to think of like a specific location. So maybe if he thinks like, oh, Storm's End, then he might be seeing through a weirwood at Storm's End. We don't the know. Only, we don't the know. only way you could yeah. control any of it is with thought. I mean, it's not a matter yeah. of pulling levers. Like each little root is like, you know, <laughs> an address yeah, yeah. or whatever. That'd be funny. But I guess what we're supposed to take from it, though, is that as long as a location has a weirwood, you should be able to see through the weirwood. You just so it, it, it would I guess it's more of a geographical knowledge of where weirwoods are to where you can tap into. I'm, Matt Diff is asking if the trees are male above the ground and female below. I have no idea what that, how to answer that. <laughs> hmm. I mean, the roots of the things penetrating blood ravens. So that's actually, we made tentacle porn jokes before about that. So I don't know. I'm not sure what you mean by male and female. I don't really see the weirwoods as male and female. They seem beyond that. They're just scary faces, trees, man. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, they they like to penetrate humans, like I said, but it's they're kind of it's a mutual consumption. You know, the green seers are living inside the trees and being fed by the trees, and the trees are consuming the bodies of the green seers. So it's they're just turning into the same organism. Um, but yeah, I was. And then as far as what did you think of, of the whole idea, like the weirwoods cradling the Starks here? Um, it could also go back to our theory about the ancient kings of winter. Certainly it supports that. Like, you know, mm -hmm. Ned is, is figuratively sitting in a weirwood throne. Okay. Like Bran is cradled by weirwood roots because he's in a weirwood throne. Ned never sat in a weirwood throne. But here in the dream, the weirwood is cradling him like a throne. So it kind of implies that his archetype. The king of winter position is that of someone who sits in a weirwood throne. And that's what I'm saying is that the original king of winters were exactly that. Yeah. This could also be a happy memory for the tree itself. If we think of the trees, remember, and what's important to a weirwood, well, Ned being there, cleaning the great sword, you know, we're reminded of the scene after he performs the execution of the night's watch abandoner he's cleaning his great he's wiping the blood off of it and so that becomes a meal for the weirwood so a happy memory for a weirwood tree would be a time where someone's giving it blood so that could be why specifically we're at this moment that it takes that the weirwood tree takes brand to do you remember the time when we drank all that blood <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, not uh, Michael Jackson on the mic here, but that's pretty pretty crafty. All right, so now let's go back to the actual chapter here. Um, comes back. Went to, um, tell us what you saw. Oh, yeah, it's, it's Leaf. Okay. Tell us what you saw. From far away, Leaf looked almost a girl, no older than Bran or one of his sisters. But close at hand, she seemed far older. She claimed to have seen 200 years. This random world building, the George info dumping here. Bran's, oh, go ahead. Bran's throat was very dry. He swallowed. Winterfell. I, I was back in Winterfell. I saw my father. He's not dead. He's not. I saw him. He's back at Winterfell. He's still alive. Do not, um, no, said Leif. He is gone, boy. Do not seek to call him back from death. It's interesting that she like, tells him, like, don't go trying to revive the dead there. I saw him. Bran could feel rough wood pressing against one cheek. He was cleaning ice. Um, yeah. Not only does that, is that a very obvious foreshadowing that Bran can and will try to bring someone back from death, but also okay. the rough wood pressing against his cheek as he's saying, I saw him cleaning ice. Mm -hmm. That's that's Will atop the tree in the prologue with the tree pressing against the sap pressing against his cheek 
as he watched the others kill Waymar. And I've always made the parallel between Ned and Ice and the others and their ice swords because the others kill Waymar. They kill uh, Waymar. And then Ned yeah. kills Garrod, who's the one survivor from that group that the others didn't kill. He goes and gets killed by an ice sword as well, only it's Ned with ice. So it's like yeah. interesting parallel here what to make of it i mean waymar i mean will up the tree is a symbolic green seer in that scene but uh yeah and this because we don't hmm. get um uh, did it say if he was young like the specific moment of ned sitting here cleaning ice this could be the moment where he's clearing off garrett's blood like the moment before catelyn comes into the godwood to see him so that could be that You're instant right. moment like like, yeah, again, we have to go back. So, of You're course, right. Bran's vision will be going right back to the like the early, the, the first book, the first chapters. It's got to be that moment. That's beautiful. It's right before Catelyn walks in. Yeah, we need to start back. <laughs> That's my headcanon now. That's awesome. That's incredible. Okay. And, of course, the old you know, Waking the Dead, maybe that has something to do with the Winterfell Crips. I think it has something to do with John's resurrection. Because John needs a better resurrection than Barrack or Cold yeah. Hands. He needs to be sexy for Danny. Danny's beautiful. <laughs> John needs to be, stay pretty. Come on, Bran. You're our only hope. He's also John's only hope for erections, too. That's literally true. I don't think Cold Hands or Barrack can do that, so... We need a better resurrection, guys, for Danny's sake, <laughs> if you will. Yeah, we need we need a green resurrection because of the th of our three options, green, red, and blue. Green is the one that has more life in it. Yeah, I mean, Danny's had she's had Dario, dude. The mm -hmm. the, the the bar is set. Like I'm, I'm thinking that Dario is setting the bar at least like kind of kind of high. I don't think it's a low bar that he's set. So John needs to needs to bring it. <laughs> this is what the crowd wants i'm pretty sure i'm just playing to the crowd that's all okay so let's see uh do not call him back ice, cleaning ice you saw what you wished to see your heart yearns for your father and your home so that is what you saw a man must know how to look before he can hope to see said lord brendan those were shadows of days past that you saw bran you were looking through the eyes of the heart tree in your God's wood. Time is different for a tree than for a man. Sun and soil and water, these are the things a weirwood understands, not days and years and centuries. For men, time is a river. We are trapped in its flow, hurtling from past to present, always in the same direction. <clears throat> the lives of trees are different. They root and grow and die in one place, and boy, this voice is getting old, and the river does not move them. The oak is the acorn, the acorn is the oak, and the weirwood. A thousand human years are a moment to a weirwood, and through such gates you and I may gaze into the past. But he heard me. He heard a whisper on the wind, a rustling amongst the leaves. You cannot speak to him, try as you might. I know. I have my own ghost, Bran. A brother that I loved. A brother that I hated. A woman that I desired. Through the trees I see them still, but no word of mine has ever reached them. The past remains the past. We cannot learn from it. We can learn from it, but we cannot change it. Will I see my father again? Oh boy. Okay, hang on a second. If you need time to work your voice, I could talk about the brother that I loved line. <laughs> Please do. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, so first thing I want to say here is when he, he says like, oh, he only heard a, a whisper, a wind rustling through amongst the leaves, but we read the Prince of Winterfell. And when he says Bran sees Theon, that's a second moment of him saying a name and that person seeing him. So Blood Raven might just maybe some humility for blood raven but he might not be as strong as bran is because bran's words are definitely being heard by people when he's looking at them through the weirwoods we have two examples ned and theon 
But anyway, so brother that I love, brother that I hate it, woman I desired. So the woman I desire is, is Sheer Sea Star. The brother that I hate it is is Bitter Steel. It's the brother that I loved that becomes the uh, question that people ask. Like, well, is he talking about Dayron the Good or is he talking about Damon Blackfire? Now, Dayron, now George has talked about the only thing worth writing about is the heart in conflict with itself. So that is why I am on the point that it is Damon he is referring to specifically. Because Dayron the Good tried to be, he tried to be good to all of his half siblings. So Dayron being the brother that he loved, that's the easy way out. Damon being the brother that he loved, but also the brother that he ended up having to kill. That's the heart in conflict with itself. And it makes sense because if Damon is looking for support, going to his half-siblings, his bastard half-siblings, is an obvious choice. And Bloodraven, now, when Bloodraven is in Eris's reign, he's both Hand of the King and Master of Whispers. But my headcanon, right, and I don't think this is too far-fetched, I think he probably got his start as Master of Whispers for Dayron the Good. That's probably his, that was probably his start. And that makes Blood Raven super valuable to Damon Blackfire because if he because it's my brother, the 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 Master Whispers, the guy whose job it is to know all the King's secret and a member of the council, a small council, that would be a very valuable person to have on your side. And Blood Raven may have, I think he might have played double agent at that time. He probably may have been feeding Damon some false information and telling Dayron all the truths. And that's why I think it's so important that Damon Blackfire was arrested in the, before the Blackfire Rebellion. He was arrested. He wasn't, so he wasn't killed outright. He was taken alive. And I think that's because Blood Raven wanted to give him a, a chance. Like, look, you're my brother. I love you. I'm doing this for your own good. But then Fireball broke him out of prison and then the Blackfire Rebellion happened. So, yeah, I'm a very strong believer that the brother I loved is him referring to Damon Blackfire. That last part makes a lot of sense about arresting him first. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that really had, does sound right. That's pretty, that's yeah, pretty only, good headcanon. The only reason he keeps Damon Blackfire Jr. alive after the Second Rebellion is for political reasons. But when it comes to every Blackfire after that, he has no problem killing them. So, yeah. And it's really, um, like, he'll not only kill Damon, but he killed both of his sons, too. I mean, that's... Mm -hmm. That's well, some, tough. Some, if that's someone he cared about, that's tough. Someone's weirwood arrows killed all three of them. Can't say for sure they were all blood ravens because the other raven's teeth were firing too. But if we believe Eustace Osgray, then no, right. they were all blood ravens arrows. <laughs> all right. So I'm going to read this in a more normal voice. It's a whole paragraph, guys. So I don't know how much you want to listen to raspy blood raven, but... Once you have mastered your gifts, you may look where you will and see what the trees have seen, be it yesterday or last year or a thousand ages past. Men live their lives trapped in an eternal present, between the mists of memory and the sea of shadow that is all we know of the days to come. So, so that's kind of also why the Green Seers are in the darkness. Like they're, in, they're living in the void, in the chaos realm. It's not necessarily to be feared. It's just the unknown. Certain moths live their whole lives in a day, yet to them that little span of time must seem as long as years and decades to us. An oak may live 300 years, a redwood tree 3,000. A weirwood will live forever if left undisturbed. To them, seasons pass in the flutter of a moth's wing, and past, present, and future are one. Nor will your sight be limited to your god's wood. The singers carved eyes into their heart trees to awaken them, and those are the first eyes a new green seer learns to use. But in time, you will see well beyond the trees themselves. So, interesting information here. One, green seers can see out of more than just the trees. And two, Blood Raven is saying that the children did carve eyes into their trees to awaken them. Not faces, though, you notice. So it could be that... There is two steps to that. Because remember, my theory is generally that the faces are a symbol of the defilement and invasion of the weirwoods, which is why they look to be in pain and look to be bleeding and cut, murdered, etc. 
So, yeah, perhaps eyes were the original way, and uh, and that, then it yeah. got then it changed. Also, we noticed the black gate is not bleeding. It's a talking weird face. There's no. It's not carved, and it's not bleeding. So, the carved face could be like an imitation of the black gate, and that could be what he means when he says. Um, the children gave the weirwoods eyes. Oh, no, he says carved eyes into their heart trees. So, yeah. Yeah. So For me, this paragraph hits at a personal level again, because my, my personal sigil, which you see on the opening of all my videos, is the fact that he's using moths, and mine is an emperor moth. And I took, because I, I did draw inspiration in, from the emperor moth stuff, and a lot of it had came from this paragraph, moths living their lives in a day. But the eyes on the wings being a thing for that. So just that's just for more of my my own thing. But anyway. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, uh, no, that makes the um that makes it extra cool. Yeah. yeah. No, that wasn't sarcasm, Lucas. That guy trolls here sometimes. So anyways, um when Bran wanted to know, in a year or three or ten, that I have not glimpsed. It will come in time, I promise you. But I am tired now and the trees are calling me. We will resume on the morrow. So, Blood Raven doesn't know when Bran's going to be able to see out of more than the heart tree's face. Um, but here comes a very interesting part. Hodor carried Bran back to his chamber, muttering Hodor in a low voice as Leaf went before them with a torch. He had hoped that Mira and Jojen would be there so he could tell them what he had seen, but their snug alcove in the rock was cold and empty. Hodor eased Bran down onto his bed, covered him with furs, and made a fire for them. A thousand eyes, a hundred skins, wisdom as deep as the roots of ancient trees. Watching the flames, Bran decided he would stay awake till Mira came back. Jojen would be unhappy, he knew, but Mira would be glad for him. He did not remember closing his eyes. Go ahead, Tim. But then somehow he was back at Winterfell again, in the godswood, looking down upon his father. Lord Eddard seemed much younger this time. His hair was brown, with no hint of gray in it. His head bowed. Let them grow up close as brothers, with only love between them, he prayed. And let my lady wife find it in her heart to forgive. Father. Bran's voice was a whisper in the wind, a rustle in the leaves. Father, it's me. It's Bran. Brandon. Eddard Stark lifted his head and looked long at the weirwood frowning, but he did not speak. He cannot see me, Bran realized, despairing. He wanted to reach out and touch him, but all that he could do was watch and listen. I am in the tree. I am inside the heart tree, looking out of its red eyes, but the weirwood cannot talk, so I can't. Eddard Stark resumed his prayer. Bran felt his eyes fill up with tears, but were they his own tears or the weirwoods? If I cry, will the tree begin to weep? That's an interesting thought. I mean, mm -hmm. that like that the weirwood sap like bleeds more when there's a green seer inside that's literally sad about what's happening. Like, yeah, we do see the faces on the weirwoods, at least poetically, seem to shift a little based on the scene. Interesting. Yeah. So what's worth noting here, too, is, is that so when Bran was looking at Eddard through a more recent time and he said and he calls out it seems like uh ned hears him same with theon but when he's looking at him through a uh, years past then it doesn't seem like he hears him so maybe the more recent moments you can have a green seer can have more influence on but things that are years gone by like this scene uh the influence is less and less and maybe that's why brendan says that he can't and you can't influence things because he's probably looking back at, you know, the first Blackfire Rebellion, Sheer, a sea star. He's looking at things. Yeah, that, that could be. Gone. Yeah. I think Bran's he's, more powerful. I think that's all it's going to come down to is that Blood Raven can't and Bran can. So, mm -hmm. um, but Blood Raven does say all he heard was a whisper on the wind. So, Blood Raven has probably done this a million times where he gets people to look at the tree for a second and he's just like, that's all it is. They'll just look at the tree and, and hear wrestling and that's it. So, um, But maybe that's the true tongue. Like maybe the true tongue 
is like part of that ability to understand the leaves. Okay, so, and then of course, as I always point out, Bran's not in the Weirwood Throne anymore. But now that he's wedded the tree, he can still see Weirwood visions in his dreams when he's separated from the throne. So that's interesting. Um, go ahead and keep reading the dream here. Yeah. The rest of his father's words were drowned out by a sudden clatter of wood on wood. Eddard Stark dissolved like mist in a morning sun. Oh, I guess we now should see. Hold I'm sorry. We should say what Ned saw, right? So he's obviously praying for John and Rob to grow up as brothers, right? Yeah. And then what does he say? Let my lady wife find it in her heart to forgive. Yeah. Yeah. So he's just talking about Kat and bringing John home. Yeah. And why, and why he can't tell Kat the truth because he needs to keep John's origins a secret. Right. And yeah, no, because that becomes the question, right? It was people ask like, well, why didn't Ned just tell Catelyn the truth that this was his nephew and he was protecting him and maybe she would have been more accepting of him? And the answer is because he didn't know Cat. He didn't know Cat at all. This was a, a forced marriage. Like she was supposed to marry his brother. He didn't know, know her True. at all. So he didn't know if he could trust her with that information. Now, who's to say that years down the line, maybe, you know, maybe five years in, Maybe he could have told her, but he might have just always had that doubt of like, you know, this woman's kind of a stranger to me. I don't know if I can really trust her with that because maybe she might get in her head that we need to press his claim. You don't yeah, know how it, it was a very yeah. dangerous secret. I agree. So the rest of his father's words were drowned out by a sudden. Oh, no, you were reading. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the rest of his father's words were drowned out by. Uh, yeah. Sun and Clatter Wood on I've read all this. Okay. The girl was the older of the two. Arya, Brandon, Bran thought eagerly as he watched her leap up onto a rock and cut at the boy. But that couldn't be right. If the girl was Arya, the boy was Bran himself, and he had never worn his hair so long. And Arya never beat me playing swords the way that girl is beating him. So, yep, this is Leona and Benjen. She slashed the boy across his thigh so hard that his leg went out from under him and he fell into the pool and began to splash and shout. You be quiet, stupid, the girl said, tossing her own branch aside. It's just water. Do you want old Nan to hear and run and tell father? She knelt and pulled her brother from the pool, but before she got him out again, the two of them were gone. Oh, I should have mentioned this in the Leanna stream. So this is Leanna being trained at swords secretly out of her father's after her father has forbidden it. And that's why it's yeah. like, do you want father to find out? It's like, yeah, Leanna training with swords is not allowed. And not only does Leanna do it, she has all of her brothers helping her. And here she is browbeating Benjen. She's like mm -hmm. beating his ass with it, but then also being like, shut up or he'll hear us. Like you can see what an alpha yeah. Leanna is <laughs> like, not to go back to that again, but like, and this know, is going to tie still... back to the dynamic at the tournament where we see Benjen coming up with armor for Howland and then Leanna and like running, doing little favors and finding stuff. And like, yeah. I guess imagine Benjen had just spent the morning getting his butt kicked by his older brothers. And now he's just like, okay, Leanna, I'll tell you what we, I'll show you what we did today. And now he's getting beaten again by her. Like that's probably how his day went in the morning. His brothers beat on him in training and in the afternoon, she's beating on him when he's trying to show her what she missed out on. Yeah, she's um, she's a she's a hellfire man. There's a reason why she at 14, 15, whatever it was at Heron Hall, literally beat up three squires and was like, "That's my father's man." <laughs> like, she is. That's her. That's her personality. Anyway, cool. Shout out to Leanna. And shout out to the Leanna stream, which is doing super, super well. Um, so after that, the glimpses came faster and faster till Bram was feeling lost and dizzy. He saw no more of his father, nor the girl who looked like Arya, but a woman heavy with child emerged, naked and dripping from the black pool, knelt before the tree and begged the old gods for a son who would avenge her. Who's that? Any theories? I mean, I know the prevailing one is that this is Sarah Snow. But I'm not sure if I like that one because 
I'm not even sure if we can really talk about it without spoiling House of the Dragon, to be honest. Um, we No, I mean, we're deep in this stream. We can give a House of the Dragon spoiler warning and then talk about it. It's fine. Okay, so Sarah Snow, bastard, uh, bastard sister of Cregan Stark, uh, supposedly was wedded to Jace, to Jaceris Targaryen, and uh, he may have gotten her pregnant and then... But Jace... Jace dies in the Battle of the Gullet by some random Mirish crossbow men, right? If I'm correct? Yeah, I don't know that that fits. Um, That's why I'm saying, like, who would she avenge if it... Because if it's just some random crossbow man, man from, you know, Mir that got him, who, who, who are you avenging? Like, you need... If you wanted someone to take revenge for you, you need like a specific name and a specific person to take that revenge on. Yeah, does anybody else know? Are there any other theories about who this person is? Because I'm not, I don't have a strong guess. I mean, it could be so many people. The next one is easier. Then there came a brown haired girl, slender as a spear, who stood on the tips of her toes to kiss the lips of a young knight as tall as Hodor. Um, so that's obviously Dunk and probably young Nan, um, mm. who was oh, once was... slender as a spear. And she had to... Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I was, I was thinking another person who would come out naked, praying to old gods and pregnant could be... Alice Rivers, after Amon One Eye dies, if she actually is pregnant with Amon's child, but oh. it seems it seems like this is all taking place at Winterfell. Yeah, she would be not in the Riverland; she'd be at Harrenhal. Yeah, every other one was. I think we have to assume that it was. So then it says a dark-eyed youth, pale and fierce, sliced three branches off the weirwood and shaped them into arrows. So this can't be Blood Raven because we're going back in time. And we're That's too far Brandon's back. Girl. Like Blood Raven. Um, well, I guess he was an adult when Hodor was an adult. Yeah. So that could be. But more likely, this is Brandon Snow making mm -hmm. weirwood arrows to kill the three dragons as a backup yeah. plan when the days, when the days, in the days of the Conqueror. So check out my yeah. Why Torn Knelt video for that. But yeah, I think that's what that is. You concur? Yeah, I think that's like the night before the King of the North knelt. Yeah, something like that. Or before yeah. they went down to the Trident to meet them, would be. Yeah. So maybe like a week before. Yeah. <clears throat> so that the tree itself was shrinking, growing smaller with each vision, whilst the lesser trees dwindled into saplings and vanished, only to be replaced by other trees that would dwindle and vanish in turn. And now the Lord's brand glimpsed were tall and hard, stern men in fur and chain mail. Some more, some more faces he remembered from the statues in the crypts, but they were gone before he could put a name to them. So, seems like we're flying back in time here with the trees These disappearing. Are... Like, those trees live for hundreds of years. You, he said the oaks 300, redwoods 1,000. There's definitely oaks in this god's wood. So, we're going back hundreds of years here. Then, as he watched, a bearded man forced a captive down onto his knees before the heart tree. A white-haired woman stepped out, uh, stepped toward them through a drift of dark red leaves, a bronze sickle in her hand. So, yeah, first men times here. No, said Bran, no, don't. But they could not hear him no more than his father had. The woman grabbed the captive by the hair, hooked the sickle round his throat, and slashed. And through the mists of centuries, the broken boy could only watch as the man's feet drummed against the earth. But as his life flowed out of him in a red tide... Brandon Stark could taste the blood. That was a good day for that tree. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta say it was a good day. <laughs> As, again, like these are hap what Brand is seeing here is is horrible to his eyes before the tree. Getting that meal of blood is a happy memory for the tree. It's a happy memory for the weirwood, and yeah, so like we're we're flying through time, and now we're we're in the time of like ancient Starks, first Stark kings. Like Starks have ruled the North for eight thousand years, if we 
believe the tales to be if if we actually believe those tales to be true but so that this is going to show like how he specifically said redwood lives for a thousand but this is showing just how old weirwoods can get if we're going back five six eight thousand years at this point to the to the beginnings of of the stark's rule so yeah uh, some of the theories for how for what this scene was maybe it was, it was cold hands Maybe this was the making of the green zombies, although I don't think so. Um, maybe this was uh, the opening of this heart tree's eyes. I don't think so either. I think this is a generic weirwood sacrifice. I think scenes like this have happened hundreds of times in front of this tree. So yeah. I think this is a generic archetypal scene. Uh, it does point out that like in ancient first man culture, it's like, uh they probably had something more like the wildling wise women and witch women and stuff. Um, yeah. You know, where like she's bronze, conducting the ceremony. Go ahead, Tim. Cause a bronze sickle that's fens. the help. The fens are bronze workers. That's like their sigil is the bronze bronze ring and a red sun now. So the fact that, yeah, that it's a bronze sickle is showing this is some more first men, but wildling type thing. Um, also, but also like House Royce also has the bronze stuff because they're also first men culture. But th it's the Thens that I really think of because of the bronze sickle. Yeah, well, that's just because they're remnants of first men, and the first men use bronze blades. So this this would be some sort of sacrifice from the days of, uh, you know, the first men. But the, I think the most important thing is that Bran can taste the blood. That tells us mm -hmm. that this weirwood, the blood sacrifice to the weirwoods, is important. It's like we we know that it's done, but now we know that it actually like the green seers can taste it. That means it's literally feeding the trees or the green seers or possibly even the others. But that blood is nourishing the trees and it is going somewhere. Um, the question is, what is it doing? Is is that is brand drinking that blood? Like, is that strengthening his power? Um is it strengthening the wards that hold this thing, the prison of the others together? That's kind of what I think it might be. But it's doing something. So what's your theory about the blood being offered to the trees? What does it do? Where does it go? How did it start? Mm. See, this is this is where we start to diverge from these like these things being obviously not normal trees and more fungus and more alien the fact that they require a, a blood sacrifice to them or at the very least that there are people who believe they require a blood sacrifice to them because they're viewing them as gods so you know going back to how i keep um comparing them to the fungi from goth it really does make me think that the weirwoods are not a natural life form that they're not supposed to be here uh the weir the weirwoods are otherworldly in in every sense of the word like they just seem so unnatural yeah um like i said there's definitely a way to see the symbolism as the weirwoods are coming from the stars you know they they sprout after the meteors like the meteors like the rain and the weirwoods are like the fungus that pops up after a rain. So there's definitely yeah. that line of symbolism. I just can't figure out how far George has taken that idea literally as far as, you know, really, or just implying it. But I mean, I guess technically, if we want to get down to the really, really micro levels of like, you know, the primordial times of where life comes from, it would come from space, like the old old young earth getting constantly barraged by asteroids and going through all these periods until finally conditions were right for something to crawl out of the primordial soup. Yeah. I guess we should notice uh, also that the, the blood sacrifice is feeding the whole weirwood net because Bran is in blood mm -hmm. Raven's cave. The sacrifice is happening in Winterfell back in time and Bran can taste it. So yeah, it's the whole weirwood net. Yeah, which is a real world tree and fungi phenomenon, which is the sharing of nutrients through the root system. Yep. 
So there you go, guys. That's our chapter. Thanks, Tim, for joining me. I do need to wrap it up and go. I got my birds back. Left them in the room for a good three hours now. So thanks for joining me, folks. Do click the like if you've been watching and having fun. Leave a comment on your way out. That'd be awesome. Keep watching the Mo Kalen video over and over again until you are sick of it or recommend it to your friends or whatever. I appreciate it, guys. It's actually doing awesome. So, yeah. Any closing thoughts, Tim? Uh just brand chapters are hard i get why they're they're so full of symbolism that's what and i understand like they're already hard enough for george the right because they're coming from the mindset of a child and when you're a 73 year old man trying to put yourself in the mindset of a 10 year old boy that can be hard and that's why again there's so few brand chapters but when he gets in t wow i wouldn't be surprised if we if his chapter count like up substantially yeah i mean he's already written as much as dance as of months ago and he still has lots to go so it's going to be a very big book i think it'll have to be two volumes but all right guys thanks for watching and i will be back uh when will i be back we'll see i might do a midweek stream definitely next sunday uh, but we'll see all right guys take care thanks a lot oh and Go subscribe to Gray Waste Tim. It's G R E Y Waste Tim. Yeah. There it is. All right, guys. Great. See you next time. Good night.